Running. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for coming out this morning. Um, if we haven't met before, I'm Tom Britt. I probably spammed your email for the last couple of days, so you at least know the email address. But I'm the CEO and the founder of the Town Post Network. Um, we've been doing a lot of digital and website development and SEO and pay-per-click management and all kinds of stuff. And I thought, you know, let's just, let's just get everybody together and just do one big presentation to kind of highlight all of the things we're doing now. So thank you guys for coming out. Um, for all of you watching us online, we've got about 70 people or so who registered to watch us virtually. We got 50 registered to come in person. So I think it was 120 people registered total to come out for this this morning. So I was kind of blown away by that. Next time I have to get a bigger auditorium so we get just more people in here. Um, just some housekeeping things. Um, we're going to do some no more than 20 minute presentations this morning. We're going to try to keep it fast and high level as much as we can. Uh, we are going to do a break about 10 o'clock. So uh, just tell your kidneys and bladder that if you guys are getting close to that. Um, you guys know where the restrooms are outside. Um, and then about 10, 10, we'll come back and kind of finish out. We, we're hoping to have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end, maybe longer for Q and A. And we'll try to do some Q and A after each 20 minute presentation, just a couple minutes. If somebody has a quick question for the presenter, it's easier to do it while it's top of mind than try to wait till 1130 and remember what your question was two hours ago. So we're gonna try to do that as we go and kind of keep this fast pace this morning. Um, our first speaker this morning, um, He's been a, a sales and leadership coach for us. We've worked with him now for about a year and a half professionally. Before that, I think we've known each other for years before that. But he, uh, he uses a term called the BHAG. You might want to take a guess at what BHAG, B-H-A-G stands for. Exactly. Thank you, Lori Sealand. Big, hairy, audacious goals. I put the word ASS instead of audacious, but you guys get the idea. Um, and you notice on the screen this rocket. Uh, if you notice in all the marketing we do for our um, digital services, we always use a rocket or some kind of launching something happening. It goes back to when I was three and a half years old in 1969, the summer of 69. I actually witnessed and watched on television as a toddler us landing on the moon, the lunar landing. I see a couple heads knocking, nodding in the back of Mr. Noon over there. He's got a beard the same color as mine, so he can relate to that story. Um, if you guys remember, landing on the moon was a big B-H-A-G, the B-H-A-G. That was a big deal. 1960, JFK gave a speech to the Joint Congress, and he said, by the end of this decade, I want to put a man on the moon. And everybody thought he was crazy. But here he was in nine years and six months after he said that, right before the decade ended, we could put a man on the moon. And I think a lot of times in marketing and in sales, we forget what our BHAG is, or maybe we haven't defined what our BHAG is. Uh, we all run businesses. Some of you are writing payroll and trying to market and trying to do pay-per-click management. You're trying to keep your website up and you're trying to do sales calls. You're trying to do everything. And I think sometimes it's really easy to get stuck in the weeds and kind of lose track or sight of what your really big goal is and try to work towards that. If you remember the space program, we put man on the moon, we didn't say we're gonna to go to the moon, we just put a rocket in the air and we went up to the moon. It was, there were stages, there were things we did first and second. We got a guy into space and we brought him back. We put another guy in space and they circled the earth a few times and then came back. So we progressively got more and more risk, but we tried to mitigate that by doing smaller projects to get to the big BHAG at the end. So I thought this morning it'd be some good mental calisthenics to have Paul uh, go through some BHAGs with you, but also talk to you guys about leadership and just talk about uh, your business in general. And this is not a marketing pitch. Um, Paul is a, is a sales consultant, a leadership consultant, um, and he's, he's really good and it's a great presentation. So without further ado, I'll introduce Mr. Paul Sylvester. Uh, thanks, Tom. Good morning, what a, what a great, great looking, good sized group. Glad everybody's here for everyone online, thank you. I'm gonna take 20, 25 minutes and, and go over 
a little bit about leadership. Uh, I've done a few leaderships in my career, and 16 years ago, I left corporate at the C level and bought a franchise on international business coaching. And here we are 17, 18 years later, and I, I do the soft skills. Everything after me is going to be more the technical skills. And I'm more the soft skills, the behavioral side of it. And I work with organizations of, of all sizes, entrepreneurs, all the way up to Fortune 100 uh, organizations. The behavioral issues aren't much different between those two, um, between those, those two ownership or positions. So this is my website, my landing page. And as you see, we have uh, Agile on there. And Agile uh, started years ago in IT. Instead of making something so long and complicated, let's do it, as Tom was saying, let's do it in small pieces and be more agile to make changes as we go on. And that's what I'm going to challenge you guys on today, because what you're going to see after I leave the stage is, you know, it, it's it's tomorrow's world. We're already into it. And it's one of those shifts. You know, if we call it a brain shift or mind shift or, or leader shift, marketing shift, but you're going to have the opportunity to take your organization to a different level than before you were, before this morning getting here. So if, if anyone would like to reach out to me afterwards, please do. I give a, a free 75, 90 minute uh, consultation with you one on one. And I'll let you guys reach out to me if you, uh, if you f feel like you'd like to do that. So leadership to leadership, you know, lead is a verb, moving something or someone to a different location, destination. Be a reason to motivate someone. And as a verb, it, it, it is moving, and yet if we look at it from a noun, it's a person who leads or commands a group to go forward, to go to a different place. And then if we tie the two together, it's a noun and verb, leading people or an organization while being agile. And the key thing is agile. And being agile is a situation where you don't have to be 100% correct and then move on. You've got to decide what percentage you think you are at and then move on and continue to tweak and tweak and tweak. Leadership leaders lead by this diagram. The, the, the core of it is, tr is trust. And with whether you're an entrepreneur or you have three or four employees or you have a couple hundred or a couple thousand, trust is the most important thing that you have to have with your team or your clients or your prospects that you're wanting to turn. And it's not just predictable trust. Predictable trust is uh, Tom's got a handful of employees. And if, if something occurs over time, predictable trusts, they would say, well, I know Tom's going to fly off the, the handle on this. And, and we need to move from pre, predictable trust to more of an empathy and trusting situation where you're allowed to say, hey, I screwed up. Hey, I didn't get that done. How do we get it done now? So it's that, it's that trust of, of being vulnerable. Vulnerability today in the world is more important than it's ever been. Five, uh, 10, 12, 15 years ago, if a leader was vulnerable, they were considered to be weak. And that's not the case. It wasn't the case then, and it's not the case now. But because of COVID and the last three years of everything we've gone through, there's been a business shift on leadership, on entrepreneurs, on small businesses. It's been a tough three years. 
And, and now we're coming out of it. We've got new technology. We can change who we are as an individual. That's what Tom and his team is going to ask you guys to do. You're going to have to think differently than what you've thought before. To get something you've never had, you've got to do something you've never done before. So you're going to have to have that mentality of, of changing a habit, changing a behavior to be successful. Second core group here is conflict. And when we hear the word conflict, most everyone says, ooh, that's a bad word. You know, if it's conflict, it's going to be ugly. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to be disappointed. And in reality, the best organizations that have productive conflict are the ones that are more successful. You need to encourage productive conflict, respectful conflict. If you don't banter like that, and you have your employees are just yes men or yes women, then you're not getting the, the, the full value out of what they might be thinking. And in behavioral thinking, you can break it down to four different groups. Two groups like to make a decision right away. The other two groups want to think about it. They need time to pass. And when, when you get those two groups in the same meeting, a lot of times it's not productive because the fast hitters want to say, come on, get on board, get on board, go. And the others are saying, you know, I don't even want to bring it up right now. So you need to be very authentic and have productive conflict to be at a different level of the organization and personally where you are. Commitment. Being here today is a commitment. You guys are committed to your, to your businesses or your position within an organization. We're going to ask you to raise that level of commitment because to make a behavioral change, you've got to be committed to do it. A lot of, you know, one of the big reasons as a, as a nation, uh, we don't lose weight because it's not instant. Everybody wants it now. Well, the commitment is going to be doing a behavioral change and then changing your organization or your department a little bit at a time to have an advantage over your competition. Or maybe not an advantage, just an opportunity for you to get more out of your organization than you've ever had before. Accountability. Accountability is you're going to do what you say and own it. And accountability, again, is sometimes saying, I didn't get it done. Or I, I saw that error, and we're not going to make the deadline because I see the error. I'm being accountable for who I am, what I am, what I say, and what I do. And then you've got to look at your ratio of what you say you're going to do and what you really get done. See, a lot of times we judge everyone else on their actions. We judge ourselves on our intentions. So it's a cloudy world because I look at everyone out here and the individuals I know, I just see what their actions are. I don't always know what their intentions are. But when I want them to look at me, I want to make sure they know my intentions. And as long as my actions lead up to my intentions, then we're good. And that's accountability. And sometimes it takes being vulnerable to be accountable. You know, the old story is, you know, you, you, you hear people in a situation, whatever the situation, kids, my kids, I raised three girls. Dad, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, wait a minute. Are you really sorry, or are you sorry you got caught? You know, and it's usually the latter. You know, I play a lot of golf. So when I hit a ball into the trees, I tell them, the guys I'm playing with, I'm going in, and if I find it, yes, I'm kicking it out. I just want to tell you right now, I'm going to kick it out. That's my integrity of the game. 
you know, you guys want me to take a stroke? Fine. Instead of most golfers go in the woods and sometimes they don't even find it, they take a ball out of their pocket and move on. Well, it's, you know, it's just a game of golf, right? It's also integrity. And it's, it's extremely important. These lead up to the results. The results you have today, the results that you collected in 2022, what are your results going to be in 2023? What do you want different? What do you want more of? What do you want less of? What are you willing to change to get something you've never had before? If we keep on doing the same thing over and over again, that we call that insanity. Because you're looking for a different output, and yet you keep on doing the same thing over and over. So make, let's make 2023 with the knowledge that Town Post and these other experts are going to give us. Let's make 2023 the best year yet and push to be better than 2022 as a BHAG. And, and I love how Tom uses that. A BHAG is way out there. Your first goal should be a goal that you can reach. And then when you reach it, you celebrate. The second goal should be a stretch goal. And a stretch goal is something that you want beyond the goal. And if you don't reach it, that's okay because you reached your goal. But you really want to push yourself to get to that stretch goal. And then the third is the BHAG. And, and Tom's got the rocket ship and, and this room's ready to take off. And when you guys walk out of here, uh, I hope, you're, you're, I hope you're, your brain is spinning on how to use these opportunities. So agile leadership, 90% of all individuals contributors said that in agility is more important today than it was five years ago. 95% of managers in organizations, large and small, say that being agile is more important than it was five years ago. And then we go to leadership. The leaders say, 97% of all leaders say it's more important than it was five years ago. And what's interesting is we have all three groups. We have the employees, we have the managers, and then we have the leadership team. So think about where you've been the last couple years. What have you been stuck in? Yeah, it's been a tough three years. What have you been stuck in? I ask that myself quite often. It's been a tough three years for me. My goal is, what can I change? What do I have the power to change to get a different result? The four principles of leadership growth is the improvement shift from uniformity to diversity. Break it up a little bit. Don't do everything you've done the same way you've done it forever. Challenge yourself, challenge your team. Challenge your marketing department. Challenge your left side of your brain to do something a little bit different than what it's comfortable for. And the left side of the brain is the one that keeps us alive. The left side of the brain is the rules, the box. Hey, if you're going to walk across the street, look both ways. It doesn't take many chances, though. The right side of the brain loves to take chances. It just loves to... And the right side of the brain doesn't get as much attention as the left side. So I'm going to challenge all of you today. Listen and watch on how you might use the right side of your brain to be more creative. Most, if not all of you, are from that marketing department or organization. Challenge yourself to be more agile to change. The second is the abundance shift from maintaining to creating. This is a great one. I believe a lot of people and organizations have been maintaining over the last three to four years. I know I have, you know, and, and, and now I'm, I'm, I'm getting, getting on this rocket ship with Tom and the group, and I'm gonna be more creative. I'm gonna do things in marketing that I haven't done in 16 years. And it's a little scary. 
and yet I'm going to change that behavior to get something that I've never had before. The reproduction shift from ladder climbing to ladder building. Now, this is more engaged if you have employees. And it, again, it doesn't matter if you have two employees or 2,000 employees. When I came up through corporate, I was always climbing the ladder and usually kicking the guy or gal <laughs> right behind me off the ladder. In today's world, we want to build ladders. We want to bring other people with us. If we make other people successful, then you will become more successful yourself. And that's the great opportunity today for you guys is this new technology or somewhat new technology that's afforded to you by the individuals that have been doing it for a handful of years. The fourth is the impact shift from trained leaders to transformational leaders. Let's change a word there. Let's go from, from trained businesses to transformational businesses. Again, let's push ourselves to do something different, something that may be a little bit hard. It takes about six weeks to break a bad habit, and it takes about six more weeks to create a new habit. And the reason we're not overly successful at that is because it takes six weeks, not six hours. The next is the four phases of leadership growth. Phase one, I don't know what I don't know. And in this situation, it, it's, it's extremely important. When I left corporate and, and bought a franchise, because I bought a franchise, I became a coach. And yet, I left training more with visual pictures of what I didn't know than what I did know. Going into the training, going into executive coaching development. It was six weeks, it was hard, it was 6 a.m. till midnight, got a, a few breaks, this and that, that kind of tore us down to rebuild us. But at, at, at the time, when I got to training, I didn't know what I didn't know. I can, I can look back and remember that they had us playing volleyball at 6 a.m. every morning. And, and the first day we had teams and I, I, had, I was captain of my team and there's five of us, five on five. Well, about halfway through the game, we're up three or four points and the judge or the, the volleyball referee says, okay, uh, three people on Sylvester's team sit down in the sand. And we said, what? And he goes, I want three players of Sylvester's team to just sit on the ground. You're going to play from the ground. And I yelled and screamed because that's who I was back then. I said, that's not fair. And he goes, you're getting it. Life isn't fair. Owning a business isn't fair. You have to learn how to change to the environment around you to be more successful. You've got to continue to grow. If you're not growing, you're dying, personally and professionally. So I walked into that new career path of mine, not knowing what I didn't know. And in six weeks, I had a much greater vision of what I didn't know. And then I took what was important that I did not do well, and I improved on it. it took me two years to get out of my own way, but it, I, I got out of my own way. Phase two is I know what I don't know. Just talked about that. Phase three, I grow and know, and it starts to show. Now, the interesting thing about this, this is not my language, although I will own it. I got to share it with John Maxwell. There's a book out called Leadership by John Maxwell. I would suggest everyone get it. I'm giving you 20 minutes of a two and a half hour read. And uh, uh, he's a great author, so you could read all of his books and, and improve your life greatly. And then phase four is I simply go because of what I know. That's when it just turns into just keep the grease on the chain. Just keep on oiling that chain. And that's what you guys are going to see here in about seven or eight minutes 
you're going to see how to do that. And by the time you leave, you're going to see life-changing, business-changing opportunities. And if, there's always a cost associated with that. And if you leave here and are worried about what this might cost you, you missed the whole morning. Because whatever you need to do is going to be an investment, not a cost, not an expense. And we have these experts, and like your product, like you are with your organization, you're the expert. We need them to help us change, to help us improve, to help us to be more financially better off than what we were yesterday. Prioritizing leadership time. If you have a, a sales team or a marketing team, the 80-20 rule suggests you spend 80% uh, of your time with the 20% of individuals. Spend 80% of your personal development dollars on the top 20%. And you can change that from any type of, 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 of money that you want to invest in people or the organization. Determine what 20% of the work gives 80% of the return and then train someone else to do it for you. Ask the top 20% to do on-the-job training for the next 20% below them. Talking about time, time mastery, if you're doing something that's not urgent and not important, what would you call it? Somebody throws something out to me. I got six minutes left. Somebody throws something out. If you're working on something that's not urgent and not important, what do you think it would be? I'm sorry? Thank you. Waste of time. Be a distraction. You're working on a distraction. More than likely because you don't want to really get done what you need to get done. You don't want to do the hard things. If you're working on something that's urgent and not important, you're working on a delusion. If it's urgent and yet it's not important, it, it, it's a delusion. You're making stuff up. If it's urgent and important, we call that a demand. And hopefully we're working on demands more than, more than we are on delusions and distractions. And then if you're in the zone, you're working on things that are not urgent but important. Not urgent but important. So that means you're ahead of the game. That means you're not putting things off because it's going to be hard or you don't know the results of it. All right, the difference between 211 degrees and 212. What is that difference? Oh my, who said that? Oh my God, you are, we got some sharp people in it. <laughs> it is one degree. And the difference is at 211 degrees, 210 degrees, you can put your hand over the boiling water and it, it feels kind of warm and these little bubbles hit your hand and yeah, it's kind of neat. And then at 212 or 213 degrees, it starts to boil. And now it starts popping, making noises. And if you put your hand there, it's gonna hurt. So one degree, one degree, of temperature can move a locomotive up a mountain. We built this country on steam. One degrees. If you change your behavior, if you change something in your personal life and or your professional life, one degree, what might you get out of it? And, and when are you going to do it? And there's probably a handful of things, not just what you're gonna to see today, a handful of things that you could walk out of here and say, you know what, one degree, and I wanna see what the difference is. So as I wrap up, I got a short video for you. If you've seen it before, please watch it again. I always learn something new from it.
Here's the information that you can get in touch with me. Uh, I'll be here all, all morning. In fact, I move off the stage to become one of you. I've already signed up for this, and I, I'm going to learn what I signed up for. Have a great morning. Keep an open mind and enjoy. Yeah. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, so that's what we call mental calisthenics, right? Kind of get you guys loosened up, get you thinking broader than just is my SEO ranked number one or two today. Um, so again, thank you guys for coming out. We've got a, a pretty good audience watching us live online. So if you're watching online um, in the chat, you can all post questions as we go along. Uh, we'll try to answer a lot of those questions at the end, but uh, there's also, I guess, some engagement going on online right now, people asking some questions and some things. So keep that going. Um, all the folks here, if you have any questions of the speakers as we go, just flag us at the end and we'll try to take care of you. Um, just a housekeeping thing, everybody with the blue lanyard, so all of us have these little blue things. There's some folks in the back. Um, they're all with Town Post. Uh, you got Will from Apprentice University back over here. He's been working with us for about five months, and they're actually here today as well. And in the back, I've got my really good friend, and my one of my best friends ever, uh, Dave Anderson, is running the live stream. He owns a company called Leechstra Live Stream, or Leechstra Streaming, I think it's called now. But uh, Dave does a lot of live streaming events. He'll do anything from a funeral to a gala. I mean, he'll just do anything you would need streamed, and he's uh, he's really good at it. He and I actually go back probably when I first started the At Geist Community Newsletter back in 2004. I think it was one of the first things we ever did together was we tried to live stream something in like 2006 or something. And um, they were kind of failures back then, but we've kind of learned our lessons over the years. So thank you, Dave, for doing this this morning, and thanks all the Town Post staff for coming out and supporting us this morning. Um, our first speaker, so between now and 10 o'clock, our first speaker is going to be, got, uh, we're going to be talking about organic traffic. Organic is free traffic through Google, mostly. It's the 800 pound gorilla. Um, I have two experts. Uh, we've got our SEO, Corey Winger, who's going to speak first. Corey um, is more of an SEO expert on more of a regional or national level. So if you have a product you're trying to sell nationally or you have a, a regional footprint, maybe the Midwest, or you're trying to you know, do something around the, the surrounding states of Indiana. Um, Corey's going to have a lot of things you probably need to hear on the SEO side of things. When we get to local businesses, uh, which are a majority of you in the audience today, um, you're trying to market within five miles of your front door. Adam Kendrick is going to talk about local um, search directories and Google's local search. And that game has changed dramatically. If you guys have not heard this information before, what you're about to hear maybe for the first time, is gonna really change the way you kind of look at your website and your web strategy as you go forward. So with that, I'm gonna bring up Mr. Corey Winger. Uh, he's with Corey Winger Consulting. Corey and I go back a long time too. I hired him to do a lot of SEO work back when Yahoo was the 800 pound girl. Anybody remember Yahoo? I think I, th I think I still have a Yahoo account somewhere. I, it is old, yes. But he was doing SEO back in Yahoo days. And uh, when Google came around like 04, uh, we, I was doing a lot of lead gen consulting. Actually, I, I knew Corey was doing all of our SEO for our websites when I owned a web company. And we've been working together ever since. And ironically, he lives like two miles from here. So it's very close. Um, if you guys have built websites, I know MJ Brown is here. Um, I know that Platinum Living is here, some other websites that we've built. Uh, this is the guy that did all the SEO research for your websites. And those of you watching online, I know we've got a handful of you online that are watching that we've built your websites. This is the guy that did all the SEO that I talked about with the Excel spreadsheets and stuff. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Corey Winger. We'll see here. Give it up for him. All right. Good morning. I'm going to, hey, Tom, I need to switch presentations here real quick. You don't want to give Paul's presentation? I mean, Paul's got a fancy video. I don't think I can top that. You can go in this tone by yourself. Okay. Why well, we're getting this started here. So excited to be here. Um, I've been in the business, in the SEO digital marketing world for over 20 years. Um, most of that time, I was either an owner or co-owner of a digital marketing agency here in, in Indianapolis. Hopefully. I've worked um, with a lot of different companies over the years, from startups to Fortune 500s, any variety of industries. 
most of the time that when I'm working with folks um, today, I am a consultant, so it's working uh, with whom in terms of performing audits, training, consulting. We do have a very short uh, time frame here, so we're going to talk about what's changed in the last 10 years from an SEO standpoint. Some recent algorithm changes that some of you in the audience may have seen some positive or negative effects from. Top five common issues, how to correct those. And lastly, a quick recap and talk about some pricing. One of the biggest shifts we've seen in the SEO, and, and as Tom mentioned, we are talking about Google specifically, since they command 93% of the market share in the search world, is the shift from keywords to topics. Okay, so what does that mean? So if you go back to 2013, um, search was much more literal. So in this example, if you were looking for Indianapolis car repair services, the search results would more than likely show car repair services strictly for Indianapolis and same thing for pay search. Now, 2023 and in recent years, now we start to see topic coverage. So if we took that same example, right? Now we're gonna see other things intermixed into, it could be dealerships, it could be local car repair shops, it could talk about pricing. Um, should I, uh, you know, take it, do it yourself? So you're seeing topics being covered now, just not strictly search terms. And the biggest thing that you've seen is Google uses what they call search intent. Okay, so search intent is trying to determine what we're trying to accomplish based on that specific search query. Um, there are basically four categories. So if you're looking to find information, um, buy something, so transactional, go somewhere. And then lastly is research is something with a commercial intent. The way people have searched has totally changed. So 2020, 2013, once again, people are much more literal in what they focus for. So if I was doing a search for, you know, Italian restaurants in Indianapolis, I would probably use something like that. Now, today it's changed considerably. Um, we use much more of a conversational type search. What we search could be questions. Um, what we search is much longer in length, and it can be a lot more localized. Uh, a good example would be now we use something like best Italian restaurants open right now. Okay, I know there's a lot of people are gonna agree with this. It's getting harder. Um, 2013, you know, we had much simpler organic uh, search result pages. So a surface search engine result page. Um, Google ads took up less space. They weren't as prominent. Okay, now, this graphic here, which is a little bit of an eye chart, there's 18 different types of content now being displayed and intermixed between organic and paid search listings. So the complexity, the organic listings are being pushed further and further down on the page of the search results. And you're seeing more emphasis and greater visibility given to paid search. Another huge shift is Google, as it continues to grow, you know, it started its um, AI and machine learning in 2015 through rank brain, and there's been, you know, all kinds of updates to their algorithm, um, and they want helpful content. Now, 10 plus years ago, content is not at the quality as you see it today. Um, what I mean by that is you could do some, develop some content, maybe overly optimize it to some extent, build some links to it, and you could potentially rank well for it. Now, the emphasis, and there was an algorithm update in last fall, which I'm gonna talk about here in just a minute, is really puts more emphasis on providing original, helpful content um, written by subject matter experts and it's linked that's backed up by 
natural link building, uh, not unethical. All right, so even if you have good content, high quality content on your website, that's not enough now. Google, as part of their ranking factors, now want um, you to have a positive customer experience. Um, what does that mean? So 2013, if you're on a desktop or mobile device, maybe it's slow to load, maybe it's um, hard to find information, navigation's overly complex. Um, those things have changed. So Google rewards websites that provide a great visitor experience, right? What does that mean? Your website needs to load in less than three seconds. It's professionally designed. It's mobile friendly. It has simple intuitive navigation and it's secure. Adam's gonna cover this in his presentation later this morning, but it's hard to believe in 2013, local search was a mere 20% of all searches. Today, that number has jumped to 46%, huge difference. Where that traffic is coming from, you know, whether it's coming from a desktop, tablet, or mobile, in 2013, it was 11%. I find that's super hard to believe. Today, greater than 60% of all traffic visitors that go to your site come from a mobile device. All right, and lastly in this section, the tools have changed immensely. Um, 10 plus years ago, you were, you know, you had Google free tools. So you had the, you know, Google ads keyword research. You had webmaster tools, which is now Google Search Console and Google Analytics. Now in 2023, especially in the last five to seven years, there are hundreds of quality SEO tools on the market to help you grow and scale. Um, some of these include uh, SEMrush. Some in the audience may use this. This is a great tool. It's the Swiss Army knife tool of the search marketing world. You can do keyword research, technical SEO audits, content optimization, and better analysis, and several other useful tools. Screaming Frog, catchy name. That's a great technical uh, website crawler. So if you're doing any kind of technical SEO audit, um, Hrefs, another good technical audit, and also great for uh, doing backlink analysis and audits. ClearScope and Content Harmony, those are content-specific optimization tools. Um, if you've not heard of them, I would strongly recommend it. All right, I'm gonna switch gears here. So I know that there's at least two thirds of the audience mentioned that they perform some type of SEO, all right? And back in fall of last year, there were several algorithm updates that um, came about. Some of you saw increases, some of you saw decreases. All right, I'm gonna talk about this real quick. Um, before I do that, Google, on an annual basis, performs thousands of tests and modifications to their Google algorithm. And the algorithm is simply a rules that they use um, and factors and signals that determine where web pages rank in their search engine results pages. Okay, helpful content update. So there are winners and losers of this. This update <clears throat> aimed at taking, <clears throat> excuse me, Websites add quality content, helpful content, original content, and amped up your rankings. On the flip side of that, if you have a website that is outdated, your content is thin, not helpful, you may have seen some decreases. There was a link spam update. So link spam is if you're buying for links um, to artificially uh, increase the number of links that you have pointing from external sites to your site. Um, winners were obviously companies that follow ethical and Google's guidelines when it comes to building links. 
losers if you were doing any type of link exchanges, um, paying money to um, dramatically boost the number of links, that those things are no bueno. There was a core update, a core update occurs several times throughout the year. Um, it's very broad in, um, and interesting enough, this one had very minimal impacts across the categories in space. Um, for those that were negatively impacted by any updates, um, I always recommend the first thing you do is determine if it is a temporary update or is something permanent. So it takes two to three weeks for Google to roll out a new update. And during that time, it may be temporary or it may be a permanent. So wait at least two weeks, track your data, track your rankings, track your organic data in Google Analytics or whatever um, analytics platform you use and benchmark it. Um, is it changed because an algorithm or you would not believe the number of times that a company launches some kind of website update and it is technically hurts you. Um, I would strongly recommend using SimRush, Screaming Frog, or some other technical site crawler to do an SEO audit. Usually um, it's beneficial to compare the current audit with the previous audit. It makes it much quicker to diagnose what's going on. And then you want to fix those specific issues in terms of um, here's the worst error that you could fix in terms of severity and can move down. One thing I want to do uh, point out, when you start pushing changes live uh, to the website, it will usually take one to two weeks before Google to re-index that specific content or fixes before you'll start to see those things. This is a common problem that this um, impacts probably all companies at some scale, but it's, you know, how, to, how can I either, you're having trouble implementing SEO in your company or you're having trouble scaling it. Um, usually that comes down to as simple as a uh, matter of in-house resources or SEO knowledge or skill sets or tool sets. Um, most of us in this room, it's 2023, SEO is a long-term strategy, okay? It requires ongoing content creation, um, fixing technical SEO issues, and link building. And your two options, obviously, are to upskill and grow in-house or lean on a digital agency to help you. So just to keep this at a very high level, this is a general process, all right, to, to scale and grow your SEO. Um, I always recommend to start with the technical side because the number of times that I've worked with the clients that they have may have good content and maybe it has, it's quick, it looks good, it has navigation, but there are things that are preventing Google and other search engines from crawling and indexing your site. So fix your technical things first, use Screaming Frog, SimRush, Site Bulb is another um, good technical uh, auditor. At the same time, we're in parallel Start working on updating your content. Google likes fresh, updated content. Um, you know, a lot of times we get busy in our business and we collect certain things. A lot of that times could be either updating our site or updating content. When you do update content and somebody, I always, I get a, um, a sigh in the, in the audience, you should be producing new optimized content, at least two new pieces each week optimize on search intent okay and then um, simrush and clearscope are good content optimization tools to test and and see if it's a fit for your business and lastly you got to generate quality links to your site okay there's a number of ways you can do that um, you can look at competitor sets and determine where they're linking from um, if you have really good content whether it's uh, like buying guides or things like that, those things become natural things for people to link to. So, I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, but 
there's a lot of old school tactics still being used by companies to grow and scale their SEO. I'm just gonna touch on a couple real quick ones. Um, some of those you're targeting the wrong terms. You're not factoring in search intent. You're looking strictly at like search volumes and that blinds you. You wanna make sure that the, your content matches on what that specific person searching on Google and others. Um, you're over optimizing so you're stuffing keywords too heavily and regularly into your content or your title tags. Um, it's still happening, I know it is. You're buying links, okay? You're going to Fiverr or some other uh, place online. That's, that's never good and Google will actually penalize your site or at least devalue those specific links. Um, other thing I will focus on is if you're still using uh, keyword density, which is the uh, ratio of your targeted SEO terms to the total word content, that's, that's no longer in use. And lastly, if you're creating landing pages, like an SEO page that's optimized for a specific search term, and then the same term is another page, another unique page, you do not need to do that. Google semantically can determine and match your search query with your specific content. Um, and it's not uncommon for a single web page to rank for hundreds of terms. Real quick, um, well, I've kind of outlined this process before, but once again, you want to start from the technical side. Do your SEO audits using uh, a crawler like SimRush or Screaming Frog or SiteBulb. Fix and find and address those issues. Why you're doing that, um, you've got to update your website content, all right? Find your higher value pages, whether they're products, services, or whatever is applicable to your business. Focus on those high value pages first. If you have sets of weak content, you want to combine those, create it into one stronger piece. And as I mentioned previously, at a minimum, you need to be creating two pieces of new content that's optimized uh, for targeted term and search intent each week. The reason I want to keep saying that is there have been multiple studies that if you continue that uh, pace, you, these sites that perform that uh, frequency and volume of content outperform uh, folks that don't by a factor of four. Lastly, build quality links. All right, um, I see some of you shaking your head for sure. Uh, Google competition is, gets tougher every year. Some of it is just the sheer volume of people doing SEO work. Some of it's the industry in and of itself. Um, I always recommend to first determine what the scale is. If you're losing traffic, if you're losing rankings, um, you need to dig into your data and figure out what is the scale. Did you drop for just a couple of terms? Or did you drop for, you know, dozens of terms? And I, some of you are gonna laugh, but and you know you are out here in this audience, is if you're sitting at your desk and you're doing some searches and you're going to Google and you type in whatever search and you go, man, where are we ranking? And then later that afternoon, you do the same thing. And then that evening you go home and you do the same thing. That's not gonna help you. It, it doesn't provide accurate um, rankings, reason, is Google personalizes search results and those things are based on your physical location okay your search history are you logged into other Google apps um, and certainly your browser settings so all those things if you do the those searches you're going to see different results almost every time when you do that much better is to go into SimRush or some other um, keyword tracking ranking tool and that way you get a much more accurate picture. All right, a um, couple other quick things. While you're looking at the data, benchmark how you're doing and performing to your top three to five competitors. So I would usually recommend take 10 or 20 of your, your core terms, money terms, benchmark against three or five of your top organic Google competitors and see how you fall out. Um, the reason that's important because if it's an algorithm update, you may be seeing that you and all your competitors are decreasing, or you can see that you're decreasing and your competitors are moving up or vice versa. Okay, it's kind of following the same general drill here. Um, 
just repetition, they say, is key to, to learning. So do your technical audits. Find and fix those things that are, that are hurting your rankings. Use SEMrush. Um, that's the tool of my choice. There are dozens of other tools out there. Um, update your top content. Start with your high value pages first. Update it. Uh, combine, create new content. Make sure that your content is matching the search intent that you um, want for that particular page. And I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but there are you know, lots of on-page factors that um, are actually listed and, and brought out by SimRush and other crawlers. So, you know, optimizing for your site content, um, title tags, your header tags, things of that nature. Lastly, um, high quality links from, you know, reputable and credible uh, websites. And there's a, there's a lot of question around that. People say, what would that be? Um, in SEO, and many of you probably may already know this, link building is one of the hardest aspects of this business. Um, a lot of it is outreach to relevant websites and business owners and website owners to get your valuable content uh, you know, linked from their website. There are different PR type uh, tactics that you can do, um, but I don't have time to get into that, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, I'm pretty sure, and I'm included, I'm going to raise my hand. Um, you've neglected your website and the content is outdated or your website uh, design. And that can, design could be, you know, aesthetics or it could be the actual, you know, navigation uh, structure. And the reason this is important is if you haven't touched your content, your site design, mainly your content right now, in at least a couple of years, and if you're, you know, copyright says 220 or before, that, that's not good. Specific factors that Google counts for is the freshness of your content. Is your site mobile friendly? Does it load less than three seconds? So the site speed and performance are, is a secure. Um, one other thing I want to uh, talk about real quick is if you're, while you're updating your content, you want to add different types of interactive elements to it. Um, the one to make it visually more attractive to engage people. So anything you can do to add videos, podcasts, you know, infographics, surveys, polls, anything like that to help engage and get people um, using your content helps. Um, same drill here. You know, if you're going to up date your website, pay attention to the technical SEO factors. So that's why it is super important to use your SEO audit from SEMrush or Ahrefs or any of those similar tools or Screaming Frog to fix those things before you push those um, live. Make sure the page loads less than three seconds. So speed is, is a constant thing that Google pushes as, as something extremely important. Um, obviously updating content so it's helpful. Um, it's relevant, and there are the tools of, especially around content, and I'll just say this super quick. Uh, some of you are going, well, how about AI-generated content? All right, so there's the chat bots, and then there's um, a variety of like Jarvis and other specific AI-type tools. Um, it's interesting. Uh, Google just recently stated or restated that it's not a fan of AI-generated content, and it has a way of detecting it and it gets smarter. Um, I still think that people content is written for people by people is your best way to go. Um, however, um, some of the AI stuff can help you interpret maybe brainstorming, being more creative or rephrasing some of your own existing content, okay? So real quick, I'm gonna recap and then Tom's gonna jump up here. Um, lots of things have changed in the last 10 years. Okay, from specific from keywords uh, to, you know, topics. Search intent is front and center as it will continue to be. Um, not only do you need to focus on providing awesome content, but the user experience when the person gets to your site. So fast, page load times, easy to find information, simple intuitive navigations. Um, local SEO will continue to be important and grow. There's a ton of SEO tools out there now that, that uh, really weren't existent 10 years ago that help you grow and scale your efforts. 
and super quick. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, common problems uh, dig into your data. So lean on your SEO tools, lean on your SEO experts. Um, there's always ways, if you're hit with an algorithm or even some kind of negative penalty, there are ways to always correct these things. Um, yes, it takes time. Um, it can take weeks, it can take months, depending on the severity. He wants to bring in the salesman to talk He's about sales pricing. Guy, so I'm just, I'm just, yes, yeah, no nerd. First of all, let's hear it for Corey, you guys. Let's hear it. I mean, he's, <clears throat> he, it's funny because Corey and, and Adam, who's about ready to come up, these guys work in closets. Nobody ever sees these people. It's like I pulled possums out and we're seeing them for the first time. So for them to get up and give a presentation is hard for them. And I really appreciate you guys um, helping him through that. I just wanted, Again, we're very transparent at Town Post. So I want to give people ideas of how much things could cost if we were working with you. And just so you know, the three of us work together as a team. We all three own our own separate businesses. We all work as a team and we've already collaborated on many of your projects that are here with us today. If you've done a new website with us, uh, we charge a flat $2,000. The way we do websites is very different than most website companies. We start with SEO first. Let's find out where the traffic is. What are people searching for? What products do you have and where are you ranking now? We actually reverse engineer the website to be Google friendly when we launch it. And so that whole package is two grand. We've done it for, I think, Sealand. We did it for you guys. We did it for MJ Brown. Um, Platinum Living was, in, was included in your package as well. We start there because we said, why build a website if it's not going to be Google friendly and where we want to land when we're done? The next piece is what Corey does, and this is a very, ex very highly expertise, but these site audits, um, site audits can cost anywhere from 2,500 to eight grand. Now, most small businesses here are not gonna pay that, right? That's, that's fine. If you have a larger company, you've got a lot of traffic, you're really leaning on your SEO, you've maybe had SEO people in the past, or you've offshored it somewhere and you're not getting results you need to get, that's kind of a ballpark of what you'd have to budget in 2023 to get a, a full audit done. I've seen these audits. They're very, very deep, but Corey has a great, he does a great job of boiling it down to the, here's the tasks that need to happen in order of importance. And he oversees that those things get done. And the last piece is this SEO consulting, and that's kind of an ongoing thing. So if SEO is a big part of your strategy for your website or your company, you know, for a thousand to forty five hundred dollars a month, again, it's a lot of money for small businesses. But if you're in that wheelhouse where this is important to you to have somebody shepherd that, you've got Corey's bandwidth each month. It's a fractional SEO guy that's paying attention. He's got the sim rush. He's got the tools. He interprets those things. He also oversees those things are getting done internally by your team or your or your IT team. So I just want to give you guys high level pricing on all the stuff we're talking about today. So as you guys are starting to plan for twenty twenty three. You can start figuring out what's important to me and what do I need to get done and what do I need to budget now and what can I maybe push off and maybe start the conversation about um, later on in the year. And with that, is that your last slide, Corey? So any other questions for Corey while he's up here on SEO? Yes, ma'am. Let me, let me repeat the question for the people online. So she was asking about content. He suggested two to four new pieces of content per week. She's asking, should we do that and maybe remove old content? Like, what's the freshness rating? Is it like bread at the supermarket? I mean, how fresh should this stuff be? No, that's a great question. Um, so with the latest helpful content update, if you have outdated content that's, I mean, Someone has a shelf life, right? And it's outdated if it's no longer relevant to your business. Um, that will, can actually penalize a site. So if you have like thin, dead wood type of content, I would recommend, not to say you don't want to delete it per se, but 301 redirect that page to the next uh, likely page that fits that, you know, categorically or directory type level. So that's a great content. Or great question. A lot of people have dead content. Make sure, look in your analytics to validate that it's not driving traffic and organic traffic. But you're right, it, it will not help you um, if it's just, it doesn't match 
Google's helpful content update. So uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Yes. So this question for the people online, if you just update the content, maybe add some paragraphs, reword some things, throw a couple new paragraphs in to old content, does that help your ranking with Google to see refreshed content? For sure, for sure. And, and kind of the rule of thumb there, if you've got existing content and you do want to refresh it, add to it, modify it, um, you want to at least add 30% new content to that particular page. It's kind of a, a, a benchmark. But for sure, um, you don't always need to create brand new content. If you have good existing content, it just needs some love. For sure, update it. Make sure you know it's optimized for the search engine use those tools. I did have one question come in through the chat, and I'll get to your question here. I'm sorry. Um, the Jack Cannon asked, "Do hamburger menus or hidden menus on desktop affect your SEO?" I would not see how that would affect. It uh, shouldn't affect it. It shouldn't affect it at all. Because hamburger menus are used on mobile anyway. Correct, correct. And, and that's more of a usability thing from a mobile device standpoint. Was there another question down here? I'm sorry. Lori Sealand. Lori asks a million dollar question. If your website looks great on desktop, but doesn't look so great in mobile, is that a big deal? Am I boiling that down? And, and that's a good question. And that's happens a lot actually, right? Um, from, I'll put my SEO cap on. Um, if there are certain factors, if they are dramatic performance issues, so if it's loading a lot slower, or if there are dramatic shifts in the layout of your website, those things can have some technically negative impacts because Google's doing a much better job at um, tracking those three things through like mobile usability and core web vitals, which launched in May of 2020. So those things, they're not deal breakers, but if you're looking you know, for an incremental uh, fix, those things can help for sure. Let's do one more question then we'll, we'll skip on them. We'll, we'll take Scott in the front and Hold your question until 11 if you don't, or 11.30, we'll do the Q&A at the end. I'm just curious, how, uh, how is Google able to tell if the content is generated by one of the chatbots? Because like, it seems like that content is written so well, and it seems really clear to me that it's written by a person. How is Google able to determine that? How is Google, how is Google able to determine AI bot content versus natural organic town post kind of content, Corey? Good question. Based on what I have read, and it's still pretty new, okay, um, is that their technologies are able to look at content. You know, there's lots of plagiarism type checks and see if that content matches a very similar, but if people remember when people were spinning articles, you know, changing, Basically, you're plagiarizing something, spinning it, changing it, and making it look new. All I can tell you is it's it's um, built into some of their new technologies, um, but that's something I'd have to Google. Good question, because, yeah. I mean, they get Google gets smarter and smarter in their technologies and their algorithms with, with machine learning and AI. Um, it's it's uh, pretty impressive. So. Hey, Corey. Thank you, can Corey. Can I pick you back on that? So... Um, with that question, I've actually tested that because um, even before Jet, Chat GPT, there have been, it, it's an evolving technology and there are services out there that'll help you write things. Um, so if you ever use one of those services, there are tools that you can actually scan your content to see if Google's going to think that AI wrote it. And AI, it, it's like, Chat GPT is like the, the next level, but it still sends certain signals that based on how it writes the tense, things like that, it is getting better, but Google's still able to see it. And I've actually, I've got what I call dummy websites that um, when I put it, 
I've put just pure AI generated content and I've watched rankings fall and fluctuated. So it's really good right now for helping to come up with ideas, structuring it, but just make sure that you go through, rewrite it. And then there are different checkers that you can find online that I would run the content through just to see, you know, what signals it's going to send. Adam's jumping ahead of himself. He's our next presenter. So uh, we'll get Adam Kendrick up here. Adam is our Google expert. He does all of our Google paid campaigns. He's going to talk about that after the break. But before the break, since this is still local and organic, we thought we'd piggyback off what Corey just went over and talk about local search. So everybody, let's give a hand to Mr. Adam Kendrick. Well, everything that Corey said was, was fantastic. Um, and if you do all the things that he had spoken about, it is going to have a big impact on your local SEO. Um, it's all integrated. Local SEO is just really important to smaller businesses, but all the pieces come together. Um, I didn't do an introduction slide, uh, so a little bit about me. I've been doing uh, local SEO, Google Ads, for about nine years. Um, not as old as the Yahoo days like Tom. Um, but I've been doing this for a while, fell into it um, out of college, and I started working with small businesses. And, and I've gone to corporate and, and bigger organizations, but I really fell in love working with small businesses. And so when COVID hit, I started my own, my own agency, and I became a certified um, duct tape consultant. And built my business around why I call my agency protection advertising. My goal is there's lots of information out there and there's lots of agencies that do things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and so that's why I've named my business protection advertising is why I joined the duct tape group because they have the same philosophy. And that's why I partnered with Tom and town post because he and I, think the same way, but also the tools that Town Post brings to local businesses and local clients is um, just, it, you can't compete. I, I haven't seen it in any other market, and so that's why I'm excited to be here. Um, so with that, we've all heard, um, you know, pandas, penguins, pigeons, all the updates. Those were things that Corey kind of covered they all have different Google code names, um, varying depending on animals and things. But Corey covered a lot of that. Um, in terms of, you know, just kind of percentages, 82% of local searches follow up offline via in-store visit, phone call, purchase. 74% um, of internet users perform local searches. 61% of local searches result in a purchase. 59% of consumers use Google every month to find a reputable local business, and 59.5% of all searches are doing it on a mobile device. So referring to the question of, you know, does my desktop, my website looks fantastic on desktop, you know, not as great on mobile. The shift is going to mobile. Most of my ad traffic is mobile. Uh, you have higher conversion rates on mobile. So making sure that your mobile website is better than your desktop would be the priority if you had to pick between the two. Um, so when it comes to local SEO, there's you know five important steps to kind of laying the groundwork. It's creating local content, whether it's your Google My Business, whether it's Facebook pages, whether it's getting PR press releases. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting your business listed in different directories, uh, citations. Um, you want to make sure that your website, so all the things that Corey was talking about, that your website is up to date, that you're doing all the right things there. It sends signals to Google on the local SEO side that your uh, Google business profile is going to take into account with your rankings. Um, and to, to get into that a little bit more, one of the ways that I present local SEO 
is it's all about trust. You know, Google's product is people looking for solutions to their problems. If they present a product that is not good, so if it's a business that doesn't answer calls or you know isn't taking care of their online presence, you know, people are going to stop using Google. So Google has worked with different ad campaigns to actually background check businesses, but they really have no idea how to tell, are you a trustworthy business that we should send people to, that people are going to come back to Google to use? Um, because that's all part of how Google makes their money. So sending the right page signals, building trust, that, that is a key part of the local SEO game. And one of the ways that Google is able to figure out if they can trust you is your review game. Making sure that you're getting consistent reviews. You know, it used to just be Google reviews, but if you've noticed in the search bars on the side, Google's pulling reviews from other sites, and that does send signals. And one of the keys with reviews, we'll talk about it a little bit more uh, later on, is that reviews, um, <laughs> that reviews can't come all at once. So if you get like 100 reviews and then you don't get any more reviews, you'll get a huge increase in visibility and then you'll flatline. Google wants to see at least one to two reviews a week, depending on your business. And you do have to look at the competition because it is harder to get reviews in certain industries than others. But Google wants to see consistency. Google trusts consistency. So, um, and one of the things Corey mentioned, getting links is hard. And with local SEO, you can do where you can actually network locally with businesses to get backlinks that give your site authority. And so with local SEO, there's local pack ranking factors and local organic ranking factors. And so this has been recently updated. It, it's kind of turned, turned over. So back, back in the day, it used to be citations were you know, one of the key factors. Now it's your Google business profile. It's are you posting, are you adding photos, are you listing products? Then after that, it's reviews. Reviews are now the second most important thing when it comes to local ranking and local search. After that, it's all the things that you're doing to make sure that your website is properly optimized. And then it's backlinks, it's are people engaging with your profile, citations, and then personalization, You know, having a new unique logo nice photos within your profile. On the opposite side, uh, we'll, we're going to touch on this quickly, local organic ranking factors, your website, your backlinks, behavioral. So these are all the things that I'll highlight here is there's a local factor to your business because people, Google, as Corey was saying, Google knows where you are, it knows your history, and so it wants to serve you the most relevant results. And so below the map with local organic ranking, if you're a local business, it's how you compete with bigger franchises. You have the advantage because you are here locally and getting local links and, and doing things that say, I'm here in this location and the best option for a Google searcher. So with your Google business profile being the main thing that influences your ranking, you want to create content. You want to get those photos, reviews, as I was mentioning, um, you know, getting, getting links, but being a community resource, local contributor, contributor, having local landing pages. So say if, you know, you're here in Indianapolis, you have a page for each individual suburb in the city, that plays a factor in your rankings as well. So as I was saying with um, getting listed, cited, and mentioned, you, know, you want to create your Google business profile. Um, the next important citations are going to be Bing, Facebook, and Yelp. There is also, I was just talking about Nextdoor. Um, depending on your industry, it can be Home Advisor, Angie's List, or it can be some of the medical directories, but make sure that you're in those industry specific directories as well, because those are all very important 
and adding credibility and trust to your business. Um, and so that's where, besides those main big ones, there's thousands of smaller directories out there that you want to add your name, address, phone number. Um, and within all of these directories, you add things like keywords, categories, descriptions, videos, and images. So all of that content you know, are on those directories. Again, it feeds into Google being able to crawl all these other sources where you're listing your business information and Google learns to trust you based on this information. Um, so I just wanted to highlight as I was talking about local SEO and local organic, um, my client is Simply Clean Carpet Care in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, he was my second client ever. I've been working with him for about eight years now. Um, and so this is how your map looks on desktop. And you'll see at the top, we don't really have time to talk about it, but they're local service ads. That's a combination of you know, Google. Google's always trying to monetize search and find ways to make money. So that's where they're doing the background check. And that's where if you want to get listed in there, there's things that you have to do um, to make sure that you can show up there. But it pulls reviews. Um, it's pay per lead. You can listen to phone calls. And then you'll see here where Google has monetized within the last couple years the map pack. So you'll see, you know, I was looking for a carpet cleaning company in Lexington. Someone didn't optimize their ad campaign properly. So that's a, a rug store showing up for carpet cleaning in Lexington. Um, but you can see here, then it shows the other businesses. So say if you know, you're a new business, you're trying to get, get up there, your business isn't ranking, you can integrate your ad account to your local your, your Google business profile and start to have ads show there. It's, um, we'll talk about it more in the ad campaign, but it's great for retail. But this is where, you know, this was a screenshot that I did this week. And one of the tools that I use allows me to see where you're ranking naturally. So taking out your search history, um, it, it's as if there's no history at all. Where would you rank as a business? And so I did carpet cleaning Lexington versus carpet cleaning. And there's a big difference, as I was saying, if your website is optimized for local, you're a local business, you can rank very well in your market because you're in your market. Your citations, your links are all saying, I'm in Lexington, I'm a Lexington business. You've joined chambers. All of these things help you rank much better locally versus you know, just showing up if someone's just looking for carpet cleaning because that's where you're competing with national franchises. There's like four franchises in this market that have quarries, that are able to pay quarries and are ranking above your business, but they can't compete locally based on how their site's designed if you're doing the right things. But most businesses aren't, so they're not able to capitalize on this niche because Google does want you to serve locally because they know the bigger businesses can afford to run those map ads. So as I was talking about getting listed, there's data, uh, data compilers. Um, that's tools like Axiom, and you basically support submit your information and then these citation sites that you can't manually put your business in, they'll crawl that and they'll pull that business information. That gets you into more directories, vertical directories. So that again is, is it a, a niche within your industry that is trusted? So again, like Angie's List or Home Advisor, um, you know, depending on your industry, Memberships, that's your chamber. That's your, your local community if, if you have um, a local charity. Schools, I've seen sports teams. I've seen there's like this pool team franchise where different pools across the company or across the country, they offer this service and then they get, give a local link that's a great domain authority. So there's all kinds of little local backlinks that really add value 
um, if you know where to look. And so, you know, and then there's other look in your market, check for other listings, use tools that, you know, you can use the href tool that Corey was talking about, and it'll show you where your competitors are getting their links from. Go through their links. A lot of times, those are links that you can go in and get as well. So, with your website, so again, this is where Corey was talking about optimizing your website. You want to make sure that your website really highlights your name, address, phone number, um, that you have you know, relevant links, local keywords, titles, descriptions, headings, URLs, that's all optimized for local, and that will really help your business um, rank as well. So with reviews, again, reviews are now the second most important factor. And you want to go and make sure that you're claiming all the directories that someone can leave you a review. So you have the ability to respond. A lot of times it's just going to be some of the main ones like Google, Facebook, Yelp, but there are a lot of different places that I'll show where people can leave you reviews, but you want to make it easier on your site, give them the option to review you. And if you're scared of negative reviews, um, a fun stat is that Bright Local says that a 4.6 star rating is the ideal rating that you want to have for your business. If you have perfect five stars, nobody's really going to trust that because no business is perfect. Everybody makes mistakes and you're going to find somebody or have some bad situation where you'll get a negative review. So make it easy for your potential clients to leave you a review. Um, you know, there's different tools out there, different review sites beyond, you know, your traditional search engines, as I was saying, Yelp, Facebook, but insider pages, city search, local.com, Merchant Circle, all these sites you're able to leave reviews on um, and just ask for reviews and then repurpose your content. Make it a requirement for your sales team. Um, have, I, you're not technically encouraged, but make sure that your sales team knows to be like, hey, if you had a good experience, please share it. Let people know, go out and give reviews. Make sure that if you're working with a business and you have a good business partnership, that they're giving you a review and you're giving them a review. And then there's software out there that helps you automate the process where there's a follow-up. Um, one thing to mention in all of that, make sure that the tools that you are using are not doing what is called review gating. So a few years back, there were tools out there that would allow you to basically say, hey, did you have a good experience? And if you didn't have a good experience, you would be funneled into a place where you could handle that privately. Now, if Google catches you using a tool like that, they will ding you. They, I, they could take down your profile. But if the tool is, it goes out there and it says, hey, would you like to leave, leave us a review, you know, or encourage to leave a review regardless of your experience and you send them directly to a place where they can leave a review, that's fine. I have clients that do that and it's part of the process to make sure that they consistently get the reviews that they need. Um, and as I was saying earlier, network for the right links, um, create local strategic uh, partner network, businesses that you work well with that are in different verticals, uh, trade useful content, uh, conduct local interviews. Um, that's a, a good one. There's a reason there, there's tons of podcasts out there, and some of us have to wonder, how do they make money? They make money with links because they'll get people linking to their site. They'll do an interview, create the content, and then they'll link back to another site. So a lot of agencies are working where they will do these podcasts to get those links because, as Corey said, it's really hard to get links. Um, so doing interviews, podcasts, it's a great way to get links from the podcaster. You'll be required to link to them, but you'll be showing your interview on your site, and it 
it helps the podcaster, strengthens them, and the link comes back to you and helps you. Some other great, um, as we were talking about local trade groups or chambers, your chamber membership, a lot of times, it's worth the yearly payment just for that backlink. I've got clients never show up to a chamber meeting, never do anything with the chamber. They just pay the fee for the link and it has an extreme local value. Uh, I know Paul was mentioned earlier, if there is, you know, we were gonna give you life-changing information. If you're starting your business now, or you know, not doing too much SEO wise, if you're getting those chamber links, that's, that's worth it. That will have a significant impact on your rankings. If you're able to get backlinks from schools, government entities, nonprofits, as I was mentioning, or chambers, that's great. Um, you know, the .org, that is a very powerful backlink, typically, if you can get those. Um, one way that I found to get clients that backlink are there are certain, in Kentucky, there are certain um, benefits that state employees get. And so if you sign up with the state to offer a discount to state employees, you get a link to your site and it's super powerful and helpful. Um, but one of the reasons that I like Town Post, one of the reasons I work with Tom, is we've created one of these directories it, that is locally focused, that brings everyone together. We've, we link to our clients, our clients link to us. We've invested a significant amount in this, and with that, it helps give our clients an advantage. Um, there's a little repeat there. So what if there was a way to get this done for you? Again, this is a service that we provide. Um, there's different ways to package it. Um, you know, so with typical local SEO management, it's going to be in the 299 to 399 range. And the review management with the software that we use um, and with us managing and helping build the workflow, again, it's in that same price range. And then with local link building, it's ad hoc. I know that small businesses always have um, a flexible budget. There are certain links that are, you know, for us can be in the hundreds of dollars or, you know, they can be $20 backlinks. So again, it depends on your budget and the way that we structure it, but the way that I always do it for my clients is, is I know which ones are gonna get you value, and we do that on an ad hoc basis. So with that. Um, and Adam, just to clarify, that's per month, right? That's not a one-time, one and done, correct? Yeah, see, this <laughs> is what happens when you don't let the, the sales guy do the pitch. <laughs> Thank you, Adam, let's hear it for Adam. It's a great job. Any questions from the audience before we let him go and we take our break? Any questions on local SEO? I know I learned a lot from this too. I, I think this whole reviews thing, and when you look at your website, it's less than 30% of what's really important. It makes you really want to focus on the other 70%. Those are things I think are kind of low hanging fruit things we can take care of. But any questions for Adam before we take a quick break? So uh, we're gonna take a quick 10 minute break when we come back, we're going to do a, a demonstration with spoke notes. Since you guys are all marketing people and small business owners, we thought uh, we'd bring another local technology company and do a 10-minute demo on their adding video to anything presentation. And then we're going to jump into paid ads with Google and programmatic advertising. So uh, programmatic has been a buzzword. I'm going to last because I'm the grand finale. Uh, but Adam's going to give the presentation on Google. So let's just take 10 minutes. You guys relax. If you're watching us online, just keep the feet up and we'll be right back.
Okay, everybody got two minute warning. Two, uh, we'll get started in two minutes. Test, test, test. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Let everybody kind of filter in as they come in. Um, so again, you're all digital marketing people. You're all looking for an advantage over your competitors. You're looking for things to do that nobody else is doing. And we just so happen to have a company in our backyard, a technology company that John Wexler started called Spokenote. And just by a show of hands, how many of you guys have actually heard of Spokenote already? You've heard of it? I see a couple of palms right. in the air. Most people never heard of it. you got some work to do there, Jason. That's perfect. I love it. So the Jason Manship is with Spokenote. He's going to talk about what their technology is. I, I told him he'd get a 10-minute plug to kind of show us um, how it works. We also have some demos to hand out to everybody. That's great. Hi, y'all. Thanks for, uh, Tom, thanks for inviting me to be here today. So John, our CEO, would normally be here. He is currently in Austin, Texas, pitching to a group of uh, uh, investors and potential partners down there. And so we're a startup here in Fishers. Uh, we have been around for about six months, so we are brand new and fresh. Uh, and we believe this is a very, very big piece of technology that makes marketing scale relationally. It helps you build a relationship with your people uh, at scale using personalization and video. Uh, and so a little bit about me first. Uh, I went to school at Ball State. I graduated with a degree in entrepreneurship. And my senior project was to create my own business out of thin air back in 2005. And the idea was a local search directory, uh, at the time called Muncie Pages, right? Because I lived in Muncie. And so uh, I've been following the SEO world for a very long time. Uh, and what these guys have taught you earlier today is absolutely vital. Um, I have run a digital marketing agency for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, I know that world intimately and what they're telling you is stuff you must apply to your business. It's absolutely mission critical to success in today's world. And so a few years ago, I shut down my agency and started using Mark Cuban's terminology of eating your own dog food. And so instead of helping others do digital marketing, I said, I'm just going to start a company that uses digital marketing. And so about eight or nine years ago, I launched a catering company here in Indiana called Nameless Catering, um, which is, I think, now the fourth largest caterer in the state of Indiana. Uh, and then three years ago, I launched a board game store in downtown Noblesville called Moonshot Games. Uh, and so I've taken the entrepreneurial spirit, applied digital marketing at scale, and figured out how to uh, grow a business. And so today I'm here to talk to you about Spokenote. I tell you this story because as I was listening to Adam talk, uh, I'm a big believer in duct tape marketing. Um, the, the concept of you know grassroots, get out there, get the business done style of marketing. And what the duct tape marketing folks teach you is to get someone to buy from you, they have to know you first, they have to hear about you somewhere, right? Then they have to like you, and then they have to trust you. So part of my reason for telling you this background story today is so that you guys trust me. I'm, I'm a reasonable local guy with a background that understands your pains and your challenges, right? Once they trust you, a customer might be willing to try it. And so uh, we're going to pass out some samples today of Spokenote um, so you guys can actually have some to take home and play with and try. Uh, I can provide more samples if you guys need any. And for those of you that are watching online, um, comment, if you would, that you'd like to get one of these, and I'll mail you a free sample just so you can try it as well. So let me spend just a second explaining what Spokenote is. I think this is... One of the things that I, oh, I need my phone for this feature. Hold on one second. I set it down so it didn't buzz, and then I realized you need a phone to do the thing. 
So Spoke Note basically lets you add video to anything. It brings the digital and the analog worlds together. Uh, what you have in your hands are stickers. Okay, each of those stickers has a QR code on it, and every one of those QR codes is absolutely different. They're totally unique. If you get a 10 pack of stickers, all 10 of them are different. If you get a 1,000 pack of stickers, all 1,000 of them are different. The way the application works is you scan the code. Okay, it's gonna pop up a browser. You don't need an app at all. You don't download anything. You don't have to create an account. It just pops up a browser. And it allows you to do one of two things. Record a new video or select an existing video that's already saved on your phone. Let's just run through this quickly. So I'm gonna record a video. Hey, we're here today at the uh, Town Post Digital Marketing Summit and uh, we're just testing SpokeNote. Okay, I attach that video to my code. One click, right, it's gonna upload. Uh, and it takes, you know, depending on your latency and your bandwidth and such, it's gonna take a few seconds to upload. Once it's uploaded, the next person that scans this code sees my video, right? They don't scan a new one, they see my video. So this is what we call a hero card concept, which allows us to send maybe thank you notes to a customer, um, <clears throat> where you can say, just personalize it with video, so much different than just handwriting something. Man, you can lean in, right? I have a stack of 20 business cards that about 15 minutes before we started today, I recorded a video on each of these that just said, pleasure to meet you at the Town Post Summit um, here's my contact information. Reach out to me if you know you want to talk more about SpokeNote afterwards. And so the the cool part about this product is you could use it anywhere for anything. Uh, the challenge as a startup that we're solving is where where do we go first, right? So we're um, the term I use is we're burdened with potential. There's so many cool things we could do with SpokeNote. And so some really good examples maybe for some of you in the audience. Thank you notes are a big one, right? That's just a really cool way to create that conversation. We are rolling out in the next couple of weeks an analytics feature that will tell you who's opened this, right? So you'll be able to send out a mailer to 500 targeted customer leads and see which of those actually scanned the code, which is a super valuable piece way to understand who's, uh, who's opening your stuff, paying attention to your brand. It's a lot easier to open a door when someone has already gone down the marketing funnel and tried the product, right? Now you can get them to buy the product. Uh, and so it's a really good way to get them in that space. Um, there's also, if you're in the service industry, a perfect example. If you're a, a HVAC person, right, and you come out and you replace my um, heater at home, right, and you put in the, um, the filter, record a video on how to replace my filter, stick it right on the unit, right next to the filter, I don't have to ever think about that ever again, right? It just simplifies that process entirely. And it's not some pre-produced thing from corporate, right? It's a personal conversation and experience, which is super interesting. Uh, and then it has a lot of really cool practical emotional connections too. Probably my favorite use case that we've found so far is you're a parent and you're reading with your, your, your young child, right? And maybe it's the very first book they've ever read before. And you get a video of them reading their first book Take a sticker, slap it on that book, put it on your shelf. 10 years from now, when you pull that down, you can rewatch your kid watching that or re reading for the very first time. Like, what a neat practical use case for something, right? And so, uh, we're spoke note, we're based here in Fishers. Um, we're growing very quickly. Uh, and uh, when we were talking to Tom, we haven't had time to flush all this out yet, but we are working on a package with Town Post so you guys can buy spoke notes at a discount through them. Uh, and so hang tight for us to finalize that because i he's waiting on me to get him things. I'm waiting on John to get, we got a thing. There's a lot going on. So, but it's coming soon. This is a brand new product. Like the world doesn't know this exists yet, but we're out there making it happen. And so I'd love to answer any questions, talk about any things. I know we have a very tight window, but. Yeah, any questions for Jason on SpokeNote? Yeah, there's a, there is an admin feature uh, where you'll be able to connect the code to your account. And then a, after or before recording, what? Yep. You w yeah, with a, with a kind of premium account, you can, yes. And so anything that we would do for small business owners, it includes those features. This is one just for prep use case. The sample I gave you is just one for around the house use. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the other, uh, the two features that are baked in now to the like pro account, small business account are read receipts. 
So you get a text message the moment someone opens your video, and then uh, analytics that shows you who opened the video, so you can follow up with those individuals. Does that answer your question? Uh, when you upload the video, there's an opera do what? Yeah, it's either a phone number or a title on the video you give. So you can choose to title the video when you upload it. And there's administrative features as well where you can do some batch uploading and do some other things that give you more scale, right? So this is a very simple use case of just uh, here's a single sticker. But as you get deeper into your needs, there's all kinds of features that can enhance that. Cheers. Any other questions? Yeah, I think Paul had one there. Yeah. It's a QR code. It's really designed to be for uh, anything that they would scan. I think email is a weird application, right? Because uh, they they can click links in emails, right? This is more for a practical, like, digital thing. You can do that. We have had people do that, but I would recommend the real value you provide is getting them kind of interruptive marketing in some ways, right? Like, people don't get a lot of thank you cards or things in the mail, and so when they do, it's a really interesting way to get them to move to digital. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Would I need to have my Nope. Nope. When you buy the codes, either you buy those base ones or you get a business account, they're archived permanently. That's on us. That's part of the cost of buying the code. Yep. Any I other highly, questions? I highly recommend you guys take those stickers afterwards. Yeah. Just do it. Yeah. Um, when I first saw it, I was actually announcing the Spark Fishers Parade, and John was the Grand Marshal this year, and he was passing out these free samples. and I, he handed me a whole handful of these. I shoved them in my backpack. A couple weeks later, I found them. I go, what the heck is this? And so <laughs> to me, the, the technology and really the sell here is the ease of putting a video onto a QR and then putting that sticker somewhere. So think about with your customers or maybe an invoice or you know, maybe, maybe you mess something up uh, with a client and, and you record a personal video. Hey, we're really sorry that happened. Um, you know, here's the invoice. I'm so sorry I took it off the invoice. And you take that sticker and you stick it on the invoice and mail it to them. They're going to scan it. They, they want to see what the sticker is all about. Right. And they get a personalized message from you. Um, I've actually sent them to my um, Christmas cards. I send them out with birthday cards now. Yep. Um, so it's just a great touch to add that video personality. And the to me, the sell is the on-ramp to getting the video up. And it's just, it's easy. That's right. You're not uploading stuff. You're not. That's right. You're not editing anything. There's no TikTok involved. It's all easy <laughs> stuff. So let's hear it for Jason. Cheers. Thank you Thanks, so guys. much. Spoke note, everybody. Spokenote.com. So now we have um, the paid portion, uh, paid advertising. So we're going to stay out of the social media side of things with Facebook and Instagram and all that because you guys are all doing that. Um, it's not that hard to do. You guys are, are doing it. On the other side, we've got Google ads and you've got programmatic advertising. And so those are two big buckets that work very well for small businesses. We um, obviously, um, Adam is doing this for a living with Google. And I'm going to talk about programmatic when he's done. But this is kind of the paid portion. So when you want immediate response, you want to make sure you're ranking for certain things or you want to be seen places by your potential customers based upon their profile or where they've been or what they've been looking for. Pay attention for the next hour. So Adam, it's all yours. Thanks, Tom. So um, definitely interesting on the spoke note. I've got clients. Um, Jason, quick question. Are we able to use those QR codes for direct mailers? Because I've got um, that would be fantastic if you're a lawyer or lawn care season's coming up. And I know lawn care companies, you can um, put a, a new twist on a, an old marketing tactic. But um, yeah, so next up for me, again, part of why there's a good crossover between Google Ads and local SEO is because of my experience working with small businesses and integrating their campaigns to making sure that their paid side is working with their local SEO side. So why to run Google Ads for your business? Um, it increases leads and customers. Uh, it's a dynamic marketing channel. Again, it's, if the campaign is set up correctly, it's instant. Um, you're going to get a great ROI if everything is, is lined up. You can target your your target.
target customer and if you're a good candidate for Google Ads, um, you know, it's, it's going to lead to a great, a great lead, lead flow. Um, and if you aren't running smart campaigns, you're going to be able to get a lot of data uh, and understand where people are searching, um, you know, where are you getting your leads. And if you set everything up properly, you'll also be able to tie a direct ROI to your ad budget, which is what everybody wants. You know, you know, and that's what I focus on with my clients is how much am I spending? How much is that making me? You know, is it worth to run ads? And so when you're, you're building a campaign, that's what you want to focus on. A lot of the times people will say, you know, what's my average cost per click? Right. Everybody uh, for a while has been focused on, well, my CPCs are high, my CPCs doubled. A lot of times when I take over a campaign, your CPC is going to go up. So, um, but that's because my goal is to get you leads or business, not get you cheap clicks. But to get into things, there's um, different can campaign types that you can run within the Google Ads platform. Um, so you have search network. Uh, search network is you know all the written text ads that you see. So it's between um, it's at the top. It's where Google makes a majority of their money. Next is the display network. So the display network is where you're running Google image ads. Um, you have your display ads that you'll have a designer create that you upload. Google has been moving away from those display ads because Google wants to make as much money as possible. So on the, the ad side of things, always look for Google to find ways to make money, and it's an inventory game. So what they've created are responsive display ads that will scan your website, pull images, give you headline ideas, and it allows them to take that ad and arrange it in a different, different manner and allow your ad to be high quality and, and serve on all different types of devices and you don't have to worry about creating those ads. Um, there are shopping campaigns, so that's your products. It's similar to Amazon shopping. It's when you, you're searching for something and you'll see all those products listed. Uh, video campaigns. So if you're wondering how do you run YouTube ads, you do it through the Google Ads platform. There's no specific YouTube place to run ads. You, you go in, you merge your YouTube channel with your Google Ads account, you upload your ad video to YouTube. You can have that ad video public or private, but you run it through your video campaign. And a lot of times, um, I know a lot of small business owners run Facebook ads. Your video Facebook ads do perform somewhat well with uh, YouTube, but there are different tactics and strategies when you're running YouTube ads. And then you've got your app campaign, so that's ads you know, within either Apple or um, Android's app store. So commonly, what we see or I see when I take over an ad campaign, if the client has run it, is a smart campaign. And so smart campaigns have been around for a while. They, they were first known as AdWords Express. Um, the goal was to make it really easy for you to go in, set it up, say this is my business, this is what I want to run, and then Google runs with it. Early on, AdWords Express had a lot of issues so they ended up rebranding re it, and they referred to them as smart campaigns. And that is when you set up your ad account from scratch, that's going to be what Google tries to get you to create. And if you ever have been in within your account, there is a switch to expert mode. And so that's where you move away from smart campaigns. Um, but the way that smart campaigns work is they want to try and get you and all the different platforms that I just listed before, YouTube, Display, um, running Gmail, because they have all this inventory 
that they want to sell. They, they want to sell, you know, places where no one really goes. And so smart campaigns, um, there's other variations, uh, local campaign, which turned into performance max campaign. These campaigns are designed to, they do get you results, but a lot of times I'll see clients are running them and then all of a sudden performance stops and you don't have, and then it never comes back. And then that's when a client will come to me, they'll be like, well, what happened? These smart campaigns optimize in a way, but then they fall off or these smart campaigns will just start running ads on your brand and say, I'm getting you all these calls, but it's just people that would have called you anyway and you overpaid for that brand click. Um, so with Google Ads Pro, or when you switch your campaign over to a, the expert setting that they try and deter you from, it gives you the insight to create those campaigns at an individual level, smart campaigns, try and force them all together, and you get all the data insights that smart campaigns hide. So you can now see demographics. You can see, am I getting clicks from this zip code? Um, you know, what, what demographics am I reaching? Um, what, what keywords are really getting results? Because smart campaigns won't let you bid on keywords. They have you bid on themes. And so you have much more control with Google Ads Pro or you know, just, it, it's just Google Ads, just not smart campaigns. So um, one thing that I want to highlight is just the anatomy of a search ad because a lot of times either the smart campaigns don't do a good job of highlighting the intricacies of the ad. Um, so with this, if you, if you look at the ad, you've got your core headline. You can have up to three headlines in an ad if you get the top spot. You'll notice that the ads below are smaller. Each of those ads can have up to 30 characters. So that's where I have to get creative and make sure that whatever you're trying to sell, I highlight in that ad. Um, below that is the description, which Google will show up to two uh, descriptions, but you can have three or four descriptions in a campaign or in an ad that switch off and on. Below, so this, this would be the core of your ad that typically always shows. You're also able to edit your display URL um, and then have a call extension phone number and sometimes the call extension will show there or on the side or be more prominent. Um, but below where I see clients not maximizing our site link extensions because people if you have particular services or things that you want to highlight, your site links are going to get people where they want to go faster on your site. Um, and that's it. If a site doesn't load or someone doesn't find what they want when they land on a landing page, they're gonna go the other way uh, quickly and they're gonna go down to the next ad. I see a lot of times with clients, it's people just go down the ad until either A, someone answers the phone or they get a hold of someone to, to solve their, their issue. Um, there are other types of extensions, your location extension. Um, that's when you merge it with your GMB. So sometimes the address will show in the ad or it shows in the map pack as I showed earlier. Um, call outs are you know, other things that are in the ad. Um, and so with that, as we talk about leads and responses, I wanted to highlight landing pages because I can find all the right keywords, we can create the right ad, but if someone lands on a website and it's not a good experience, it, it's over. You'll, you'll lose the lead, you won't get the call. So one of the things, as we said, you see with the ad, you want it to be descriptive, you wanna have the site link options, um, that gets them the click but we've got to get them to call, we've got to get them to submit a quote, or we have to get them to buy something. And I wanted to highlight this website because this, this isn't an overly complex website. Um, okay, it's 
you know how I can switch it over to the website from the PowerPoint? Sorry, guys. So it's combining the headlines. So you can have up to three headlines, but they've got to be in 30 character snippets. So there's times, and Google's making it harder um, with their responsive search ads. I can lock headlines into certain places, but Google's making me now add up to four headlines and try and get them to show in a certain order. Um, so it's just those snippets. And the reason they're doing that is if someone's searching something and you've got multiple headlines, they want to match it something that's more relevant to their searcher to improve their experience, which has them come back. Um, so I wanted to take the time off the PowerPoint to highlight what has been one of the, and they don't have an offer. A lot of my clients have, have an offer. They don't even say a free quote. They say request a quote. But this landing page for my campaigns averages at a 30% conversion rate for different services across the board. And there's a few reasons for it. Um, this is the te desktop version, but the mobile version, feel free to check out happyhomehelpers.com. You get the trust factor. Again, that circles back to what I was saying earlier, whether it's with Google earning trust or earning client trust, it's highlighting the trust factor. There they've got the 4.7. You know, it's not the 4.6, but again, they're showing their, that you can trust them. These are people coming into your home, cleaning your home. Um, they've got their request to quote button, the call button, all very easy, accessible. Then on the hero page, it's very clear what they do. And so that was one of the things, if someone lands on the page, you wanna make sure if you're here, then this, we're, we're the company for you. It's clear, it's clean, it's simple. Um, it's not a stock photo either. And that's one of the things that depending on your business's side, professional photos are very important because especially in the home service space, not, not everybody has a you know, great reputation. People have been burned. So you've got an employee, not a stock photo, they're in uniform, it's easy request a quote. So if they don't convert there on the hero section, we've got other trust factors. So now we're highlighting all these different places you're getting reviews and they use a review tool that aggregates their reviews to show them all at once, but you've got your guarantee. So if they hire you and it doesn't work out, they know they'll get their money back. And businesses that highlight that on their landing pages versus other businesses, they're going to perform much better. I see a higher content contact rate and uh, a higher close rate for those leads. And then they hi highlight other things on the page. And this isn't even a custom PPC landing page. This is just an SEO page. And so now it gets into the SEO content, which is optimized. Again, more professional photos, um, very, very clean. And then here where we were talking about the um, having each page local SEO optimized, they've got the map and different NAP information down here at the bottom. So they're, they're doing a fantastic job on the local side and that's where it all comes together. So I wanted to highlight that. Uh, again, another nugget, depending on your business style, they're doing fantastic and their cost per lead is significantly lower than other people because they're doing all the right things. So we talked about Google Map Ads, so we'll, I'll go over this a little bit faster. Um, again, it, 
your Google map listing is going to be your highest point of ROI because that's where people go. They see it first. They see the reviews. They're able to easily call you. So if you're trying to show up in an area of town where you don't have a good map ranking, map ads is what makes you relevant for that market. Um, but to get into lead quality, so I was saying I don't go for cheap clicks. I go for good leads. Yep. Nope. So because they're a service area business, they don't have to have an office. They just have to tell Google, we service these areas. And that's why all those areas are listed. And then within their Google My Business profile, they'll say, you know, we're, we do work in these areas. Now, Google does take into account where they're actually located behind the scenes, even though their address may be hidden. Um, so they won't rank as well further out from where their home base is, but that's how you start to rank a little bit better further from your location. And if you remember when I showed the carpet cleaning Lexington, you know that's how he shows up number one, literally on the other side of a 300,000 uh, person metro. But, so great question. Um, to lead quality, I focus on lead quality. So when I build campaigns, um, I want to make sure that I'm targeting the right keywords. So I look for high search intent. I don't want someone that's doing DUI, you know, if it's cleaning carpet or removing your tree or, you know, DIY drain cleaning. I make sure that if someone is searching that our ads are showing up, they want to hire somebody. I can build secondary campaigns that maybe show up to, well, I want to convince somebody who's DIY to hire me instead. You're not going to. It's going to take time. That's what I call an upper level funnel search. There's a different strategy to that. But when I first start with a client, my goal is to make sure that I'm getting the most for their money. Next up, I've got keywords. I want them to be location and geo focused because people are looking local. Uh, they are looking near me. They want someone close by. Um, so I make sure that my keywords target, you know, Fisher Roofing Company or, you know, Carmel Carpet Cleaning Company and making sure that I'm matching up with those. One of the things with smart campaigns, as I mentioned before, they have themes. I make sure that I focus on keywords and that's where you, you want a pro campaign because even now exact match and phrase match don't mean what they mean two years ago. Google's taking liberties and saying, well, you're bidding on this keyword, but this search result is relevant. So I have to go in and negate terms that you're potentially showing up for because you may have businesses that are bidding on your name. They don't realize that they're bidding on your name. They wouldn't bid on your name normally because odds are they wouldn't get that client anyway, but Google's trying to get money from them and so that's where you've got to build a very specific targeted search campaign um, as we talked about earlier the ad copy we want ad copy that converts that gets the person to click so we can get them to the landing page but you want to say in the ad who you're looking for and what they're doing and what they can expect so when they click and they call they're not accidentally calling a competitor because of their ad or a service that you don't provide. With dentists, a lot of times they're looking for, you know, certain services or price range. There's ways within your ad that you can limit clients that you don't want. And that's where we write landing pages. The next stage is landing pages for target customers, not all customers. Not everyone's a good lead. You don't want your, you know, whether it's you or your intake team, you don't want them trying to qualify somebody the more you can reduce that, the better. Now, that will lead to less leads. So that's where I have to find a balance with the client and where they're at and what they're focusing on. Um, 
give your form the attention it deserves. So we looked at that one form. It was a pretty standard form, but there are ways within your form that you can add questions. You know, are you in this location? You know, people will be in an area that you won't serve, so you can qualify them that way. Um, make sure that it's a service that you actually offer, depending on your business, and you can have them pick the service. So there's things within the form that can help you filter that out to make sure that you're getting a lead that's actually generating business for you. Um, let's see, and then price ranges, I like those. Um, but where making sure that you're not running a smart campaign comes in is the fact that I have access, when I take over a client's campaign, if they've been running on pro, I can go in and optimize things quickly. I can look to see, you know, are you running ads for 18 to 24 year olds, but you've got a home remodeling company? People that age don't have houses. So you shouldn't be running ads to them. Um, you know, are you, you know, if you're running a cleaning business and it's not, you know, you're running in a certain area, you, you want to look at, you know, age range or different things. Now, depending on the industry, there are rules in place where you can't touch these demographics, depending on, you know, if you're in housing, apartments, things like that. There, there is a limit of what you can do. I can't, you know, there are laws that protect them. But if you know your business, you know your ideal client, um, you can on the back end make sure that we're your ads are serving to your ideal customer, improving your lead quality. One of the biggest issues, and regardless of how you're running your campaign, making sure that conversion tracking is set up properly is key. That is the difference between a good campaign and a bad campaign, and you making money and you not making money. Because with the smart campaigns and with different bidding strategies, you have um, there, there are automated bidding processes where I can optimize towards conversions, and that's why I focus on good conversions, because I want to use bidding strategies that get good results, and I base that on conversions. But if a client's got bad tracking set up, whether they don't know what they're tracking, no conversion data, low conversion data rates, conversions seem off, if I've got more leads than I have clicks, we've got a problem and that is more common than you think. Um, I need to go through conversions. The agency set up conversions that are no longer relevant. Maybe it was for a special that you were offering that is no longer relevant, but somehow people are still tracking for those leads. Um, inactive notifications, a lot of times someone will set up conversion tracking and then it never tracks. Those need to be checked because somewhere someone set something up ineffectively um, you know, new landing pages, old conversion tracking setup. Again, if you're switching vendors or agencies, this is one of the, the biggest things that I have to deal with besides building your campaign. And then one that happens all the time, conversions just fell off. Well, odds are what's happening right now is your agency or you are switching from universal analytics to G4, that's the biggest situation where I'm seeing this. Um, so you just need to make sure that everything's setting up. One thing that I notice that a lot of businesses don't take into account, a lot of PPC people don't talk about, is search impression share. And so search impression share is how I'm going to dictate your budget and recommend to you. Because my goal is, again, to get you quality leads at the best cost possible, and I look at your market. So basically it's because Google Ads is an option where we are bidding on the person that is coming into the market, and it's us and four other businesses, and we're telling Google, I'm willing to pay up to this cost for this person to come to my website. And so what Search Impression Share does is if I've got $10 a day, I may be showing up for 20% of all searches in the market. 
we are not going to get the best results if I'm only showing up for 20% of searches in the market. So either A, I need my client to increase how much they're spending, or I need them to target less area and refine who they're targeting. And so that's the balance of how much do you have to spend versus um, making sure that we're getting you relevant leads at a good cost. And so that's why there's typically, you'll notice agencies will have a minimum of how much you can, sp or how much they need you to spend. It's because if you're only spending $5 a day, we're not gonna get the volume or data to get you the results. But on the flip side, what I use search impression share for is I don't want you spending too much. If you only want leads or business in a certain area or a certain market, if we're pushing over 80% impression share, your ROI is going down. You're the guy that's jacking up the CPCs and making it more expensive. So I like to find that sweet spot for my clients and make a recommendation based on search impression share. And so that's where um, I do budget planning. You know, how large is your business? Are you a one person company? Maybe you shouldn't be running ads. There, there's a lot that you can do if you're an owner operator. You should be going out there, knocking doors, sending out mailers. Um, Google ads isn't going to be, you know, the fix for you. Um, you know, how competitive is your industry? You know, you may have a full law firm that does personal injury law. And you come to me and you say, I have $5,000 a month to spend. I'm going to tell you that's the equivalent of a $500 for you know, a carpet cleaning business. That's nothing. There's CPCs that are, I've, I've seen CPCs over $500. So how competitive is that industry? That's where I'm going to come up with a budget recommendation for you that you need to run. And I have a baseline of you know here is the minimum that you can spend that you will see a good ROI. And here's the maximum before you need to start looking at other channels because I don't want you to put too much into one channel. Um, and then where are you trying to target? Because with Google, if you go into your ads account, there are preview tools. So you can go into your ads account up at the top, there's a setting and Google allows you to pick an area that you wanna see plug in keywords, and it'll give you an idea. It's not accurate, but it gives you a feeling for the market. How expensive are the CPCs? Before you even talk to an agency or you talk to somebody like me, going in there, understanding how expensive your market is uh, will allow you to really hone in and figure out your budget before you contact somebody else like me to run it, and I add my fee. So with that, um, for the town post package, we charge industry standard 20% of ad spend, um, use the cover management of your accounts. It includes the following, because I want you to be successful, we will work on a landing page setup. Um, depending on your site, if it's not mobile friendly, I'll tell you that I will not run ads to a site that is not good on mobile. It is a waste of money. We won't see the results. You'll be frustrated and it, it won't, it'll just amount to wasted money. So if you're not getting a website redesign, um, there's landing page software that I use that I include in this. Um, you can check, there's different providers out there. I use Unbounce. Uh, Instapage is more expensive, um, but there are other landing pages software out there that you can use as well. Call tracking. Um, I want to make sure that we're getting good leads and that we're not getting bad phone calls. So phone calls that come in, um, I use CallRail, allows me to listen in, I give you access, you can listen to the calls, see if the leads are good, and then I make sure that the keyword lines up with the phone call. We also use click protection software, um, depends on the industry, how valuable that is but it's always something a little extra just so I know that I'm doing all that I can for my clients. And then detailed reporting and professional management and strategy. So with that, um, that's all I got. That's all you got. What do you that's mean? All I got. A lot.
Let's hear it for Adam. I thought that was great. <clears throat> so before we go too far, um, I'm going to jump into programmatic as I go behind this wall, reappear. Um, before we go too far, any questions for Adam on Google pay-per-click? I got a question over here. Yes, sir. So, you might repeat the question, Adam. No, I, asking, so. so he's talking about when you go in and you set it up initially, and it gives you like eight options. And then there's the, you know, at the bottom, there's build the campaign the way you want. They're trying to funnel you into different options of how to build that campaign and plug it in because there's little things within your campaign that I'll look to find. Um, you know, if they're putting you into the Google search network, you know, that's, they're having your ad show up on like, I don't know if anybody remembers Ask Jeeves, but that's still around. <laughs> so they're having your ad show up there. And then at the same time, they'll plug you into the display network with those ads. So that campaign, yes, they take your goal into mind, um, but it'll build your campaign in, in a manner that isn't fully optimized. So it, it really, they're trying to make it easy, but they don't tell you where they're adding, where they make their money. And they make their money, you know, they, they get the $500 CPC for PI or, you know, the, the dollar click for the restaurant, but they're not getting the money for the Ask Jeeves or those display network where you go on a blog. They're trying to make money there. So they squeeze those opportunities in there so they can add on to their margin. So. One more question, anybody? Uh, we probably have some questions online, but we're going to get to those in a minute. Thank you, Adam. We're going to keep this thing moving along. You guys are almost there. We've got one more presentation. That's me. So you guys are all so lucky now. Um, but no, these guys have done a great job this morning. Um, again, thank you to all the folks watching us online. They've been very good asking some questions back there. Everybody's asking for the spoke note stickers, so we're going to send everybody some spoke note stickers that ask for those. Um, so. Great morning. Um, before I get into my presentation, I just want to thank you guys again. This was really kind of something we just did as a test pilot. This was our Mercury One, right, trying to put a guy in the space and bring him back. Um, I think there's a demand and a need and a want for this kind of information, so we're looking at doing more of these more often. Maybe not four hours long, maybe no bagels in the back, but we're going to try to do these more often. And um, we're going to send you guys out a survey probably tomorrow and this will be for the online folks as well, to ask you what you'd like to learn more about. Um, Adam talked about G4. Google Analytics is changing to G4 this summer, and you have to be on it or you're going to lose what you've got. And so there's been a lot of questions about how do I do that. And I know he's going through some um, training on his own to help better help our clients on how to migrate from the universal to the G4 analytics. So those kinds of things we're looking into. Um, and just know that if you do come to us, you come to me or any of us, um, we do work really well as a team and we just try to mind share things. So, programmatic advertising. Um, let's see if I can make this work. Of course my mouse won't work over here. Why would it work over here? Um, so here's a little story. In 2020, uh, is January of, 20, uh, of 2020, right after the holidays, my daughter, Stephanie got a Pelotron for Christmas. And <clears throat> I didn't know much about them at the time, and I you know, quickly learned the subscription model. It's kind of an interesting business model. Well, I get the Wall Street Journal. A couple weeks later, I saw an article about Pelotron being questioned on their earnings for 2020. In Q1, they had projected higher than normal earnings in their earnings report. They were typically getting around 4 to 5% growth. And in that particular quarter, they were estimating a 12% growth, three times what they would normally get uh, in, a, in a normal quarter. So the Wall Street Journal article talked to the CEO of Peloton and asked him, well, why are you giving these extreme numbers? And what they talked about was some marketing techniques that they were using they were having a lot of success with. I didn't go into too many details about it, but what I found out was is that the CMO 
of Pelotron had figured out what's called programmatic advertising, the ability to target people where they're at, at the right time, at the right place, digitally. And what they found was they could, they found the, the floor plans of the major um, healthcare you know, gyms like Lifetime Fitness and all these places. They all had these areas where they did cycling classes in their gyms. And they found out that Lifetime Fitness only has three floor plans that they use in any city. So they found out the locations, they do a geofence around the cycling room, and they were able to day part it, which means they only fenced it for times when they were doing cycling classes. And what happened, if Corey Winger goes into a cycling class one morning, and he's, he's always got his phone on him or his eye watch or something, he goes into his class, and he's in there spinning. Well, he got fenced, he got tagged, he got targeted by Pelotron because he was there with his mobile device and he started seeing ads for Pelotron. And Corey started figuring out after going to these spinning classes, I don't have to get up at six o'clock anymore. I could just rent a Pelotron and have the same experience at home. And dang, I can, I can buy a Pelotron. And so Pelotron caught onto this three years ago. And I started reading that and I was like, well, how in the hell are they doing that? And so that got my interest up in programmatic. I started researching a couple years ago. It was $35,000 minimum to get into a campaign in programmatic. Today, that price point's way lower. It's about $10,000. But since TownPost has aggregated a bunch of accounts, we now are way over that, and we're now selling programmatic advertising. So this presentation is about what that is, how it works, the tactics that we use to target people. And I'm going to start by saying, what's a magazine guy that kills trees for a living? What are you doing selling digital? And why are we even here this morning? Well, my background is I did lead generation. I had a dot-com startup. I had a publishing company. So way back in the late 80s, early 90s, I started a publishing company in my garage. I spun it off. My, I've been self-employed since 93. In 96, I built the first e-commerce website in the state of Indiana, according to iQuest, which was the only bandwidth in town back in the day. Um, and I started a dot-com in the late 90s. I sold both my dot-com and my publishing company in 2000, started consulting. What I was consulting on and what people were interested to uh, hire me to do was doing local websites. Um, my dot com was more of a, we had partnerships like Sprint and AOL Time Warner and Comcast. We were building local broadband portals back in the late 90s, which 20 some years ago was a big deal. Everybody thought the last 10 feet of an experience was going to happen on a computer. Well, now it's all streaming television, right? So we saw that 25 years ago, we built a, a portal for that. So in the process of that, of that consulting, I started doing lead gen consulting. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, lead generation consulting is basically what we're doing this morning, trying to get leads through the internet that we can go sell something. And I had a couple pretty large clients I was working with. You know, we talk about keywords, we talk about landing pages and things. Corey was a guy I hired back in 2005 to do all the SEO. I figured out really quick that there was a lot more to it than I wanted to spend time on. So Corey became my SEO guy. And then pay-per-click, was something I had off the ground. I was working in the pay-per-click, the Google ads, um, which was way harder back then than it is today. But nevertheless, um, we outsourced that as well. And then I just kind of oversaw the lead gen to make sure we're getting content, we're getting the right people, we're converting at a good rate. <clears throat> That's my background. This town post thing just kind of started in my fourth bedroom of my, new, my last house I was in. So it wasn't the first one I started my publishing. I mean, this was my second house. And the idea with this was to do a local website that would have a local magazine and serve a community. Now, we've talked a lot this morning, you've heard it from all the speakers about trust, about people who have to like you, have to know who you are. Nobody's gonna click on an ad that they've never heard of. I don't know about you guys, but I bought a couple of things around the holidays on Instagram that thought looked really cool and I bought them and they showed up in like February from a boat from China and they weren't even close to what I thought I bought back in, in December because I did an impulse buy. When you're buying things locally, you're trying to go to a new chiropractor, you're looking for a home painter, you're looking for a new roofer. You know, the, the quality of that person matters to you. And so you're gonna do a little research. And so the more touch points you can have with people, put a magazine in your mailbox, people trust magazines. They still read magazines, believe it or not, they still read them. And if they recognize your ad, and then they see a digital display ad, or they see a billboard, they see something, they're more likely to respond to you. So this is what got me excited about digital, 
is it kind of brings my whole circle full circle. It brings my whole service of not only providing a magazine that gets direct mailed into neighborhoods around Indiana and Kentucky, but it also gives me a website and a portal and a directory that I can leverage for my customers to help them get more clients. If you guys noticed a couple of years ago, right before COVID, we relaunched townpost.com as a local search directory. That's what it's called. And it was all because of all of this. You guys can all have free listings on that site, and most of you already have listings on there. But those backlinks to you, those reviews on town posts for you, those are all helping your local organic search. It's all helping your whole strategy. And so that's why Town Post now has kind of evolved into being a, like a media company. You know, we're not just in print, we're not just doing Facebook, and we're not just doing the website. We're kind of doing it all now. And that's what these guys are here for, and that's what we're here to kind of summarize for you this morning. Uh, just a, a Town Post plug, we are a franchise system. We have 10 franchisees in 19 different cities in Indiana and Kentucky. Um, got a couple with us today. A couple are watching online. They're up in the northern part of the state. Um, great people. We provide all the infrastructure on the backside, the design, our editor, all that stuff is all done in-house. And then it allows them to go out and sell and just be the face of their community. All the digital stuff we've talked about today and all the website stuff that we're doing is all done with corporate in Fishers. So our, our franchisees are not doing SEO. They're not doing Google ads. I don't think you'd want that. Um, so that's kind of how Town Post um, works and operates. To kind of put some perspective on what programmatic advertising is, um, Adam talked about Google. The Google ad network reaches about 75% of internet or of the internet or the internet traffic in general. It's not just search. It's their ads, um, G Suite. Um, there's all kinds of things that Google has access to beyond just the pay-per-click, the YouTube ads, all that. So when you see ads online, or if you're watching streaming television, about 75% of that inventory you're watching is coming from a Google platform of some sort. Programmatic is, sits on the other side. Programmatic is basically about 20 plus ad networks. And by the way, this presentation will be emailed to you afterwards. If you guys, I see you guys taking pictures, which is great. Maybe you Snapchat it to your mom or something, but this will be available afterwards, so don't worry about it. But 95% reach, so it's basically 20 plus ad networks. So it's everybody's ad network. And what they do is they have remnant inventory. Inventory they haven't sold, or inventory they don't get very high cost per click on, or cost per uh, CPM, cost per thousand on. So they open that up, and there's these software platforms called programmatic platforms that then buy that inventory and then add targeting to it. So when somebody says, well, I can put you on my website and sell you ads on my website, and well, that's great, but you're going to be on you know, less than 1% of the internet traffic just being on their website. Or if you're talking to somebody like maybe Local IQ or some of these other local companies that are selling digital, what they call programmatic, it's through their platform. Yeah, you'll be on Wish TV. Yeah, you'll be on Gannett's website. And if I'm on USA Today, yes, I might see your ad. You may be targeted. But once I get off of those sites, I'm not going to see your stuff anymore. And so they're a very small part. And actually, Gannett, and Wish TV and all those guys, they use programmatic. You can buy stuff on their platform through us with targeting, real geofencing and real targeting, and just bypass them altogether. So this is kind of the, the part of, that we're talking about. What, what programmatic is, by definition, is delivering the right message to the right person at the right time. It's the ultimate in targeting your advertising. <clears throat> How it works. Your laptops, your PCs, your mobile devices, your cell phone, everything has a unique ID, a unique IP address. You have cookie cache. You have Google's, you know, knows what your search intent is because they're watching what you searched on on your phones or on your laptops or your computers. Your streaming devices at home. 80% of America now has unplugged from cable. So 80% of America now is streaming their content through the Internet. And that box and that, I, that address, that IP address, and the history of what's been on that box, what you've been watching through that internet connection, it all builds a profile about you that we can then target. And our software knows, they don't know exactly who you are, but they know where you live, they know what you looked at last, and what your search intent is, they know what you've been looking for. And with third and fourth party data, they even know what you bought last week. You can actually go to Walmart today 
and buy some Dones pills, you probably start seeing ads for a back adjustment from Lori Sealand. I know it's scary, but we're, we're going to get through it, guys. We'll make this. So how does it target people? Where's this data come from? Well, there's really four main buckets of data. The first is browser behavior. We know that. What you've been searching on, what you type in, what you're doing in your browser. That's all cached in your browser, whether you like it or not. And that information is building that avatar of what you do, what you like to see, what you read. The second one is mobile and GPS location. Most people have location services turned on on their phone. Some people say, I don't want to be tracked, so I turned it off. OK, I bet you did. But the bit, I bet the minute you opened your weather app on your phone and asked for your location, you said, yeah, why not? And I bet the minute you opened up Facebook and asked for your location, yeah, I, yeah, I, I do like my Facebook app. I want them to know where I'm at. I want, I want those ads targeted. I'm on vacation. So there are certain apps you'll probably turn location services on, even though location service is turned off on your phone. But that data is tracking you all the time. So when you go to different places, your phone is carrying with it a signature of where you are and where you've been at all times. And that data is available to us in the cloud remotely to target people based on where they've been. First party <coughs> and offline addressable data. So first party data is just audience retargeting. Um, geo address fencing onboards first party data, activation of 90% match rate. So this is data that we get from another source. So for example, I'm not going to name any names, but we're talking to a client that does oil changes. You guys can all imagine who that might be, and there's several of them that do it. We can actually buy data that tells us who bought an oil change from their competitor six months ago. Now what happens with that data? Well, it's credit card data. Credit card's been selling our data for centuries. Ben Franklin has credit cards stolen. I mean, that's how long it's been going on. Well, that data now can be uploaded into the cloud, and then we can geofence or target those people based upon past history of what they bought. That could be applied to any of you people. Any of these businesses, we can use first-party data. In most cases, we probably don't. Um, we've only used this a couple times in some programs we've done. We can usually use some more lifestyle and audience curation stuff, which is a little easier to use and it's more readily available. But we can get that, that close to it. Also, offline addressable data. Um, this is where we can use lifestyle changes. Um, you just got a divorce. You just bought a house. You're in the market for a new mortgage. Things you're doing trigger flags in the data sphere that we can then target because then you're likely to buy a home in the next 90 days because you just filed for your tax, uh, your mortgage exemption, or you just paid off your mortgage, or something happened it triggers you offline to put you into a profile of somebody that we can target. So this data not only is out there in the cloud, but it's also happening real time. And it happens in a raw format. And what the software does is it aggregates it and helps us target people. You know, it's not like a mailing list you upload once and just hope it works out. This stuff is happening as it happens. The one example I've used, if you've watched my webinar before, I apologize, you're gonna hear the story again. About a year ago, uh, we've got a golden retriever. His name's River. He's two years old. He's a puppy, right? So we can correct a lot of things, but the one thing we couldn't get him to quit doing was humping people. I don't know if you guys have a dog had trouble with humping. You can keep him in your yard with, you know, shock collars, whatever they call those. But how do you keep dogs from humping people when they come over to your house? So we did some research had a friend tell us about this thing called the mini educator. It's a dog collar you put on your dog. It's a remote control. It vibrates. Dogs don't like vibrations on their necks. All right, I'm game. We go online, found out they're at PetSmart. Now I buy his pet food typically at Specs. I've never been to PetSmart. I just don't like PetSmart. It's not close. So we went to PetSmart, walked in, found the mini educator, same price as Amazon. We bought the mini educator, started walking outside, getting my car, I look off to the west, it happened to be on Saturday, and my wife and I are gonna to go to the symphony on the prairie, and somehow in the, in the span of 10 minutes, a huge dark cloud's rolling in on the west, and we're gonna to go to the counter prairie in about three hours. I'm thinking, oh crap, what's the weather? So I got my phone out, I pull up the weather app, I start seeing ads for Hertz collars, um, Purina dog food ads. These are all in my app. I hadn't even left my phone yet, and I'm still in the parking lot of PetSmart. Now, 
you might say, well, that's just a coincidence. No, it wasn't. I went home, I started seeing ads for these high-end dog foods where they deliver food to your front door and it's like a week's supply of food for like $100 a week. You know, why, why should your dog eat this food when they can have gourmet food every week? I've started seeing all these ads on my streaming television, on my phone, on my laptop. What happened was I went into PetSmart. PetSmart and their national advertisers are geofencing PetSmarts. They know if you go to PetSmart, you probably 90% have a dog. And so guess what? Based on the purchase history, me buying a dog collar, in fact, I was at PetSmart, I got targeted. And it went on for like a week. That's happened to you. I know it's happened to all of you. You probably went on vacation somewhere. You went down to Siesta Key for the week. You start seeing ads for these local places in your Facebook feed, and you're thinking, how they, how they know I'm here? Well, location services, they've targeted you. They want people from out of town, because they know you're probably more likely to come to their little visitor's bureau than somebody who lives there all the time. So this data is real and it's live, and it's being used against us. Why not use it in our favor, right? So you can target things many, many different ways with programmatic. I'm going to go through six tactics in a second. But these are just some common ways we target people. If they visited your website, we can target them. Uh, keywords are searching. So they don't have to go to Google to search you. They could be on some other search engine or just writing an email and putting in search terms. If those terms are things that we want to be found under and they fit the other profiles, we can target these people before they even hit your website. Articles and content that they read. So it's, it's, reading the, it's caching the verbiage on the pages that you read if there's words on that page that I want to target somebody who's reading about this, I can target that person. The locations they visited, specs, PetSmart, households. Again, basic census data, and it's not just basic stuff, it's everything about your house, the value of your home. If you have asphalt shingles or not, if it, how many square feet your house is, what your property values are, what the household incomes are, how many people live in a house, how many children live in your house. One example is we had a, uh, assisted living facility here in town. They were doing open houses, trying to get people to come in and see their facility, and their target is not so much the 70 plus year old that lives in the basement, it's the kids upstairs that want to get the 70 year old out of their basement. And so one of the profiles we could target is people who have an elderly parent living in their home. We did a 10 mile radius, we set up conversion zones, and we had over 40 conversions at one open house. And I'll tell you what a conversion is in a second. But again, that's based on demographic data. There's over 5,000 data points we can target through that. Um, but buying, be <coughs> buying behaviors and also events. Um, a lot of you do conferences. I know PopCon is here, Carl. Um, if people are going to events, let's say, for example, I'm going to use Lori because she's sitting there and she's a client. So let's say Lori is trying to get, um, she's, they're in the chiropractic. They also have Nautilus. Um, um, Red Laser Center. But let's say there's a conference for chiropractors and they're trying to hire more chiropractors. We can actually geofence that conference and then everybody who goes to that conference will get tagged to start seeing ads for Sealand hiring chiropractors. That's kind of how that works. So what can you target? What can we buy through programmatic? Programmatic is very, very broad. Uh, we can do display advertising which is mobile, laptops, and tablets. This is the least expensive one. I'm going to show you the pricing at the end. I promise transparency. And it's also the one we do the most of. Video pre-roll. You're on a website. You're watching a video of um, Lisa Marie coming off the Grammys. You saw a pre-roll ad for that. It lasted about 15 seconds. You couldn't skip it. That is available to us through programmatic. OTT, CTV, um, streaming TV videos, TV commercials. It was pretty powerful when I went home that night from, from uh, PetSmart. I started seeing these Purina ads that I'd never seen before because I'd been targeted. Imagine, if you will, you're not buying TV time on Channel 13 hoping it works out during the new news. You're buying ads that only get shown to people who have, are targeted. They've shown a propensity to already buy what you do. They fit your profile already. They've already been filtered. And only that person in that household sees your ad, not everybody down your street who happens to be watching Channel 13 at noon. Audio streaming, podcast, we could buy inventory there as well. And social advertising, I don't push social very hard because most people have already kind of got that under control. And with Facebook's rules and the way they do things with data, there's not a whole lot we can do there. I typically try to focus on the other ones and then just try to help your Facebook ads. 
What people like about programmatic is the measurable results. We do have data on all the things that we're doing. Um, in most cases, you'll have a dashboard. It's a link. This is an example of the top part of the report. But it'll show you how many impressions have been served, how many clicks, what your CTR, click-through rate is, how many, how many conversions you have. As you scroll down this report, it'll tell you where the conversions were, where the audience came from, what geofence were they in, where they came in and converted. And what the software does, the platform that we use in the cloud that does all this, it uses AI to make the campaign even better. And what it's looking for is conversions. It's just like what Adam's looking for. What you guys are looking for, you want a conversion. And a conversion in this means somebody went to your website or they came physically into your building. That's a conversion. Foot traffic is tracked. Web conversions are also tracked. But that's the beauty of, of all this programmatic stuff. An average click-through rate, CTR, is about 0.09% on average as a national average of all digital display ads. Programmatic, since it is more targeted, is almost double the national average. Most of our clients are maybe a little bit below that or above or way above the 0.17. And part of our job with a campaign is we're always trying to figure out how to make it better, maybe better creative. We A, B test things. But it does give you the real-time stats, and people love the analytics that comes with it. There are six main tactics that we use to target people. And we call them tactics because, well, that's what they are. We're going to go in a, we're gonna go in a trench here. We're going to try to figure out how to get you to come to my website or come into my coffee shop. These, <coughs> for the most part, it doesn't cost any more to use all six of them. And in most campaigns, we'll use at least five of these tactics and maybe six, maybe all six. People ask, well, does it cost more if I do geofencing? No, you can geofence as many places as you want. It may not be practical to geofence a lot of places, but we can geofence as many as we want. So the main tactics are geotargeting. Geotargeting is an area, a zip code, a county, a state. Same as what you do on Google. You set up your geotargeting, where you want your ads to be seen. The second is geofencing. Third, geo-addressable targeting, which is a subset of geofencing and geotargeting. Keyword retargeting, site retargeting, and audience curation. So let me explain what these six mean, and I'll try to be brief. Geotargeting, again, is zip code, 20 mile radius from my front door. You're basically saying, with this campaign, I just want to focus on this area. And inside of there, I might do a lot of different things, but this is just the general area I want to be in. It says 90% of the people keep their location services turned on, so as long as their location services are turned on and they're in this area, their phones could get pinged or their other devices could get pinged. Geofencing is the ability to go down at a much more granular level to fence something. Now, this is an example I use. Um, anybody ever heard of Nevermore downtown in Indianapolis? I see some hands in the back. All the, the young hipsters go down there, right? No. What's that? <laughs> I'm tar we're targeting her because she lives next door. That's great. You probably saw these ads in. So what we did for Nevermore when they opened up is we went down street by street and we drew a fence where we wanted to target people. Okay. So if you drove through that with your mobile device, if you worked downtown, if you're staying in a hotel and you open up your laptop, you were getting targeted to come to Nevermore. We can do this at the address level. We can do it at the conference level. We can do it. We can actually manually go in and draw maps to geofence people. So you can say, "Why well, I, I want this guy's backyard and this guy's front yard?" Well, we can go and draw a map, and that'd be a geofence. It's a virtual fence. We kind of pin drop it. We kind of draw the map, and it kind of builds a little octagon, and it uses GPS coordinates to give us that location. And anybody that goes in there is going to get targeted. This is really important for most of our clients because what a lot of people like to do is they want to geofence their competitors. So imagine, and Lori doesn't do this, but imagine Lori had a chiropractor office and there was five other chiropractors down the street. She can geofence those other chiropractors offices. They would start getting targeted, start seeing ads to come to her place. If you know, if you have an art gallery and you know there's five very popular art galleries in the Midwest that people drive to, we can, we can actually geofence those parking lots or the showrooms or the galleries. Anybody that goes into that fence could get targeted 
and start seeing ads to come to your place. Geofencing is, is being used, it's very effective. What I would say to you with geofencing is as passive aggressive advertising as it sounds, which it is, it's like putting flyers in your parking lot of your competitors. Um, it's not always as effective as you think because you gotta think if they're already there, they're probably not gonna come to you, right? They've already been here. But they do have some pain and where the geofencing gets more um, exciting is when you start geofencing not competitors, but places people go that need you that don't even know they need you. Like in Lori's example, it might be a collision center. You know, somebody takes their car in to get fixed, they were in a wreck. They probably have a bad neck, they probably need a chiropractor. That's a great example of somebody we could geofence for her. Um, with the Noon Brothers over there, as I, I guess the dad and the, and the sons uh, group, uh, they do handyman services down in Louisville, Kentucky. If people are going to Lowe's on weekends, we could geofence Lowe's just on weekends. And somebody gets home and realizes that door's a little harder to put up than they thought, they might give Jim a call if they see an ad for him because they've been targeted because they were at Lowe's. Event fencing is really fun because we can do conferences, events, anything you want. So it's basically just geofencing with a start and end time. So instead of it being live all the time, we're just going to start it and end it. One of our clients is Run317. Uh, they kind of target the younger set. It's a 3.17 mile race. It's on Thursday nights. They drink beer. They have a DJ. It's not my scene. However, if you look at the crowd up there, they're, and there's one guy with a, a beard my color, but most of them are that age, but they also ran the mini marathon. So we geofenced the mini marathon start finish line. This was downtown for about four hours. So if you ran through the start finish line of the mini marathon in April, you start seeing ads to run 317's Thursday night race series for the rest of summer. So that's one way you can do event fencing. Conferences are very effective. The one caveat with conferences or any kind of geofencing around hotels or large structures is cell quality, the, the signal of the cell inside the building. Now this building is four, five stories tall, concrete block walls. We're probably not getting fenced here very well because your cell signal is not that strong. It needs a good cell signal. We tried to geofence Homorama last fall and unbeknownst to me, out in wet, uh, Chatham Hills where the event was hosted, the cell quality was terrible. We've had a couple home builders that have models and locations that we're trying to geofence or trying to do some conversion tracking. And the cell signal so weak we're not getting any conversions because no, nothing's pinging their phones there. So that I will say geofencing works as long as location services are turned on and there's a decent cell signal to tag phones. Okay, that's, yes. Yeah, so the question was, can multiple businesses geofence the same area? And the, the answer is yes. There's no limit to how many people could be geofencing your location. Yes? He's asking, is, can a person be geofenced? Essentially, is that what you're asking? So, so actually, I wouldn't use geofencing to target you. I would use one of these other tactics to target you because you're probably of a certain age. You're probably a certain income. You probably live somewhere with a home that I could put a fence around. So I probably target you differently. I wouldn't use geofencing for that. Geofencing is really designed for people coming in and out of these virtual fences to tag their phones. So if that answers your question. Geo-addressable targeting is, is very powerful and it's actually really good. So think about this from a couple perspectives. Think about your customer database. You guys have a database of customers. And maybe you're in the service industry, maybe you're an HVAC company. How powerful would it be to upload your addresses into the cloud and geofence all your customers and have them start seeing ads for you when it's time to for renewal on their contract or it's time for your HVAC system to get cleaned. Or we have a new plumbing service we're now rolling out as part of our service. We're offering it to all of our customers. So that's where addressable comes in. You can also buy offline third-party addressable data and upload that, and all those property lines get fenced as well. Now, it's, it's, pretty, it's, 
it's really good. It's about 96% uh, accuracy. What we're also finding is people have email addresses, but they don't have physical addresses. Does anybody here have a huge email database, but don't have any addresses for any of them? Anybody? You got a couple of those. So what you can do with those, there's actually another service we can upload your email list to. It'll map it and it'll map it to their actual addresses and it'll give us back about 80% of the addresses the people you have emails for. And then we upload them and we geo-addressable target them. The fourth tactic, and this is very popular with most of our campaigns is keyword search. We're kind of SEO nerds. I'm not as big a nerd as he is, but we like SEO, we like keywords. So basically we can upload a list of words, maybe from your Google ad campaign, or just do SEO research on our own, using our own software. We talked about SimRush, we use SimRush internally as well. We compile a list of phrases and words and key phrases that people, if they're searching for it, or if they're reading about it, they're typing an email about it, if it's somehow in their cache, they can get targeted with never even visiting another website. So keyword search is really, really nice, especially, I know it was, um, there's a private school here. So people looking for, they don't even know that your school exists, St. Richard's, they don't even know it exists or they've been by it, didn't know the name of it. They're searching for a good local, highest rated local Catholic school or Episcopal school or I want a parochial school or whatever. If those words are in our keyword campaign and are uploaded to a programmatic campaign, they could likely get targeted to start seeing ads for you, even though they didn't even know you existed or they weren't even searching for you exactly. They searched for a term related to what you do. This fifth one is very, very effective. Highly recommend it. I put this on every campaign if I can. There are some places that can't add a pixel to the website. We'll talk about that in a second. But basically, if you do site retargeting, somebody comes to your website. In this example, I use Taft Law because they're my franchise attorneys. If I go to Taft Law's website, about 97% of the people leave that site and never come back. Or they just don't do anything, right? They came there, I Googled it, I found it, that looks cool, ah, baby's crying, dinner's cooking, I gotta get going, they close it. What site retargeting does is we put a pixel, it's just an invisible piece of script, for those of you who don't know what pixels are, but it's just a little piece of code. We add it to the header file of your website, we actually will put it on there for you, if we can, if we can get access to it. IT guys sometimes get sideways with us, they wanna do it, that's fine too. We get the pixel on your website, the pixel then tags that person. So when they leave and they start going to other websites, other things, other apps, they start seeing ads that come back to your website. And it says here statistically about 70% of the people actually do return back. And we find in most of our campaigns, if you do have a good local strategy, you're getting some good local traffic, you got customers coming to your website, you got new people coming in, you got a Google ad campaign coming, this usually has a really high click-through rate just because there are people already been to your site once. Oh yeah, I wanted to go back there and get a quote from that guy. So this is a very, very effective way to target. With targeting and with geofencing all this, we also can do conversion zones. So a conversion zone is a geofence for your location or for your showroom. So let's use my platinum lifting example. I targeted five other galleries. I had an audience of people who like art. I have people who have a household income over $500,000 a year. I, I can target people based on those demographics. But what I would do for Platinum Living is I would put a geofence around their gallery location, and if somebody got targeted, however they got targeted, whether it was they went to competitors, they went to an art show, we were geofencing, uh, they were keyword searching, started seeing ads for Platinum Living, and then they physically come to their location, they physically come inside your fence, it shows up as a conversion in your software, in your dashboard. And not only does it work for foot traffic, it also works for web traffic as well. Again, your pixels on your website. Somebody left your website and then they came back, that shows up as a conversion. You know that that person came to your site and now they're back to my site. You can also put a pixel on what we call a form fill page or a thank you page. So if you wanna get really technical, and I know Adam loves this stuff with Google, we have a conversion page. So if somebody fills out a form, you know, if they just got to the form, that's not a conversion to me. I want the ones to fill out the form and then you hit submit, and then the next page says thank you for filling out the form. Well, that thank you page is the conversion page, right? They can't get there unless they fill out the form. So if I put that pixel on that, I can actually see the tracking on their conversions of their online lead forms as well. 
It's very, very effective. The sixth one, which is probably the loosest one, and it's one where we have to really, we've been doing this now for, I don't know, probably nine or 10 months. This is the area that we lean on our platform a lot. We also lean on our experience. It's trying to find out the right audience curation for you. Who are the right people that we need to target for you? And a lot of people think, well, I just want to get as specific as possible. What we found is lifestyle things, age, uh, where you live, what kind of home you live in, how big your house is, how big your yard is. All these things are factors we can target. It's just based on not only your geography of where you live, but your demographics, your hobbies and interests. Do you like quilting? What do you do in your spare time? Those kinds of things play into this audience curation, and we can target many, many different ones. So for example, these are just some examples of them. There's over 5,000 things we can target just in the platform. And if we, did, if we buy a list outside the platform, we can get even more um, specific. Again, using my oil change people, you know, that's not gonna be in the cloud. That data is not readily available. I can go buy that data, upload it, and that becomes 5,001 traits I can target. But just like census data, age, income, home value, how many people live in the house, life changes, recently divorced, recently married, likely to move in the next 90 days, new parents, recent empty nester. These are all profiles they know based upon your browsing history, and they put these people in these, in these virtual, what they call Lux list, and we can check that list and say, I want to target anybody who just got a divorce, because you know, I'm a realtor, or I'm a divorce attorney, or whatever you are. Hobbies and interests, gardening, music, sports, you volunteer, you like flags, you like to travel, you name it, I can target them. Industry, there's over 20 industry categories. That comes down to things like, are they in manufacturing? Are they a dentist? Um, I've got campaigns right now. One of our clients, um, they target dentists who are looking to retire and sell their practice. That's a very finite audience of people. You can't really geofence dental practices. Then you get the customers, and you get the front office staff, and you get the salespeople, and they're not looking to sell. It's just trying to get to the dentist. But guess what? We can target dentists specifically dentists in any state we want. And we also target them by age. So a guy coming out of dental school who's 22 years old, I want to target him. I want to target the 40 plus year old who's been in the racket for 20 years and looking to get out of it and go retire. Also by job title. Again, maybe uh, we just launched a campaign for a, um, an HR company, uh, PEO. Well, who hires PEOs? C CEOs, CFOs, human resources directors. So we can actually target people by their job description. And we can do multiple of them. In this campaign in particular, we just launched it last week. I think we're targeting about 12 different job titles um, within companies between 10 and 100 employees. And again, you're, only those people are seeing your ads. It's not a billboard. We're not driving by it. Only those people see your ads. Let's talk about costs. Again, we've tried to be transparent, and I've gone over on my time, so I apologize for that. Um, I told you at the beginning, digital display is the cheapest way to go. I'm making the pricing really simple for you guys. It's $10 CPM, cost per thousand. So to put that in layman's terms, if I buy a, if I buy a thousand impressions, it's $10. If I buy a hundred thousand impressions, that's a thousand dollars. And with digital, unlike magazines, I can make that campaign last for a week, a day, five weeks, two months, and have that inventory spread out over any amount of time that I want. The minimum spend on doing programmatic with us is $500 per month. That's the minimum. We just don't want to handle anything smaller than that, not because we don't want to deal with you because you're not spending enough money. It's back to Adam's point. It's not going to be successful unless you're buying at least 50,000 impressions. I mean, you're just, you're just not going to have the traction you need you, you might target people, but they only see one ad. It's at the bottom of the Weatherbug app, and they were in a hurry and never saw you again. So we want to make sure they're seeing re repetition in your ads. This is kind of what digital display looks like. There's five sizes. We do the artwork for you. You notice when that loaded, it was kind of animated, right? One of the biggest mistakes that we see when people do their own artwork is their flat images. You know, the, we did this ad in a magazine, so we just scale it down and stick it in a mobile phone. Well, it doesn't look the same, right? They look really bad. And what you'll see with our ads is they, they're animated. They, they load. There's, there, it's called an animated GIF or animated GIF. I'm sorry, Josh, in the back. Um, we argue over how you pronounce that all the time. But we do the ad design for you as part of our service. We don't charge extra for that. 
and if you have different campaigns, so in this particular case, this dentist hired, um, um, her name's blanking on me right now, but he, she's as fluent in Spanish. She is um, from Venezuela. So we actually did this campaign in English, and we targeted English-speaking people within 10 miles of their office. We did a separate campaign, it was all in Spanish, and we only targeted Spanish-speaking mobile devices. So if you were Hispanic and you lived within 10 miles of their practice, you saw this same ad with her picture, it was all in Spanish, it was catered to the user. And we do that as part of our service. Streaming television ads, very popular right now. Um, a lot of you don't have commercial spots, or maybe you've ran them in the past and they're old and outdated. We can help you get those done. Um, but we can buy on any network, any platform, except Netflix and Hulu. They have their own platforms. They don't sell in the programmatic. They won't let us have access, but we can buy on everybody else. So any streaming platform, this is a sampling of the more popular ones. Uh, of course, it's like ESPN 1, 2, 3, 4, 8. You know, there's a pickleball channel coming from Dave Anderson's group someday. But all these channels we can buy on. And again, they're only seeing these ads if they've been targeted. So let me stop for one second and explain. When I got geofenced, when I went to PetSmart, remember I went home and I, I saw a commercial that night? What happened was my phone got tagged. I went home, my phone got on the home network. Well, my home network now got tagged. So every device that's on my home IP address, my streaming television, my iPad, my wife's laptop, I have an old PC just for grins and giggles, all of them got tagged because I went home on my home network. So that's where this gets real effective with TV. Instead of buying you know, $15,000 worth of ads on Comcast and just hoping it works and only targeting Comcast customers, and they can geo-target. They can say we're only in these counties or whatever. All right, we can actually go to this next step and put you on any of those platforms, any streaming platform on any station for anybody who's been tagged through your efforts. $75 CPM is kind of the flat rate that just kind of gives you guys the idea what it would cost. So again, the minimum spend on this is $500 a month in television. You can't do any less than that. But if you want to buy 100,000, oh, so what would it be? Matt can do the math really quick. He's a CPM guy. If I want to buy 100,000 impressions, it'd be $7,500. That's a lot of impressions. And this last couple here, pre-roll video ads, these are the ones that are not streaming through your television but coming through your laptop, your PCs, and all this. You're watching, again, um, Lisa Marie Presley coming off the red carpet. It was on a website, and on a story you saw, you clicked the video. That pre-roll video, that's what these are. They're about $30 CPM. That's not YouTube, by the way. YouTube's through Google. This is everything else, essentially. And the last one is streaming audio ads. I don't know if there's any podcasters out there, anybody looking for podcast audiences. We can also buy that inventory as well. Um, this is my tapped law guy, Josh Brown. He's the best franchise attorney in the Midwest. Um, he does Franchise Euphoria podcasts. It's the number one podcast on franchising on iTunes, over 10,000 downloads a month on his podcast show. And he's looking to add more um, listeners um, based upon their title and they're into entrepreneurship, and they're into franchising. And that's it. So this QR code, if you guys want it, or also you can just email me, but that will bring up a little form you can fill out on your phone if you want more information or you would like to get some more specifics. I apologize for going a little bit over. We told you we'd be out here by noon. But at this point in the game, you guys are probably mentally stroked out um, and, and smoked and ready to go to get some lunch. With that, um, I'll bring uh, Corey and Adam back up on the stage and take any last questions you guys might have about anything we talked about this morning. Um, any questions from the audience? And also we'll be around afterwards, of course, if you guys want to. And we'll email you afterwards so you guys can ping us an email if you'd like some more information. Any last questions? Did you guys find this informative and good? Yeah. Would you like for us to do more of these kinds of things? Better pastries next time? We'll ask you for some feedback. You guys give it to us anonymously if you want. Um, but I can't thank these guys enough. I can't thank Dave in the back uh, for streaming this thing for us and the live audience that showed up. 
Um, there was 30, over 30 people watching us live and asking questions in the back. So we want to thank those guys. Josh, I want to check my phone and make sure there's no um, messages from up in the box. How do you fix the tracking issues in Google Ads? For example, I have a campaign. It uses, users are filling out the landing page form. Get the submissions via email, but it doesn't show in GA report. Adam, you want to take that one real quick? Oh, oh you're, well, you're wired up. Sorry. Yeah, I still have the, oh, you can't really hear it as loud. There we go. So um, if there's not a thank you page, typically your and, and I don't like this method. There, there's different ways of going about it, but a lot of times if it's not going to a thank you page, the goal is to track the click on the submit form. And, and there's different ways to do it, but that's, that's where the error is. And so you have to take that code and make sure that it feeds the Google Analytics correctly. But a lot of times it's wildly inaccurate. Um, so I still stick with the old school method of landing on a thank you page. I know web developers don't like it, um, and that's where if a web developer isn't willing to do a thank you page, then I'll just bring the client onto an unbounced landing form. That way I can create my own thank you page. And then there's a lot of lost opportunity with thank you pages because you can send people to other parts of your website or encourage them to call if you actually want them to call instead of a contact form. Um, so that's the most accurate way, but I would have to go in, look at it, see what's wrong, and then adjust the conversion tracking. And we're happy to do Zoom meetings with you guys or meet in person if you guys want to talk about your, your, your issues you're having or what you think is a priority. The takeaway that I have from this morning, and I, you guys will have your own takeaways from this, um, Local search is a big deal. There's a lot of things you guys can do right now with your Google business page that it's free. They can really help you a lot. Reviews are bigger than I thought. That was kind of a new eye opener this morning. Um, and also just having somebody look at your website and tell you, kind of give you an assessment on it. I know when we did this for townpost.com about, well, was right after we launched the new site, we had Corey go through it. And through the Google Search Console and some other tools that Google has, which are free, uh, we found a lot of really bad links to us. He called them trash links. The people say, hey, I got, you know, they go to the SimRush and they pull up a report and it says, hey, I got 1,200 links to my website. I'm doing great. And you look at them and 1,100 of them are really bad sites. Like they're trash, they're porn sites, they're just spam sites, they're just trying to get links to you. And so we went in and disavowed a bunch of those links. Over 400 links we disavowed, which means you break that link from them so they can't link to you anymore. And just things like that, cleaning up some of the things. Again, you know, Paul talks about that one degree. Just doing little things like that can have a huge impact. So if you need some help, you want some advice, you just want to look at things, we're more than happy to do that. We're not going to charge you a fee just to look at things and kind of give you some advice and point you in the right direction. Um, you know, we're yeah, I'm a sales guy, and I don't, but I also own a business, and I, I can empathize with your problems. I'm not here to monetize you. I'm here to help you. You know, I think I can speak for all three of us here. We, get, we feel good when we help other people succeed. And that's our own, that, you know, our bank account, I don't even know what's in my bank account right now. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. But I can tell you how many clients I talked to in the last week that e email me or call me or somebody text me this morning and say, this is great. Can't wait to hear about this programmatic stuff. You know, can you do this again? I mean, that's that's what gives us satisfaction, and I hope you guys will walk away and just know that we're here as a resource if you guys need us. Yeah.
I'm going to take a first stab at this, and you can jump in. That's a good question. I'm not sure if everybody heard that or not. But you might want to repeat the question for the people online. Okay. So, if I give you the condensed version of what this gentleman's asking is, you know, if you're generating copy, um, and the, there's always a balance for the human, all right, to consume the copy that's natural and it's enticing, and then, you know, there's the portion that you have to uh, do for the search engines. And there is a fine line and there's a balance for that. And that's kind of what you're asking for, correct? Um, this is, I would answer this. Um, first and foremost, based on whatever content that you're working on, um, do your research and dig into the analytics. Um, that's gonna help guide, one, like total word count, and two, what specific topics that you'll need. And just that, not to get overly granular, but typically, you know, if you have a specific content piece, you're going to target one primary phrase, maybe two secondary phrases, and then a bunch of related phrases. Now, that comes from your different content tools like uh, ClearScope, SEMrush, others, because you're gonna need to build out that content brief. Um, but in terms of length, um, how much is for the human, how much is for the search engines. I mean, it's kind of a delicate balance. I mean, you could say it's 50, 50, 75, 25. It depends on the industry, depends on level of competition, but um, dig into the tools because those will certainly help guide you. Um, and those things are uh, readily available. Yeah, the SimRush tool, for example, um, what I would do, you know, if I was in my agency, before I get the creative brief, I would actually go back and look at the search volumes for what I'm trying to land on. And SimRush will tell you the word count you need to have and the key phrases you should have to rank highly for that term based upon what's already being ranked high on Google. And then what I would do is I give that to my writer and say, I need between six and 800 words and here's the three phrases I need included in there. Once you have that, you can then upload it to SimRush and it will score it. And it will actually tell you it's you know, it scores 80% or higher. I mean, if you're right on it, you, you nailed it. If it scores 50% or, you know, 50%, it'll make recommendations of what you should do that copy to get higher and, and get more relevant to that page. So it, it's the fine line of satisfying Google and satisfying the end user, I think is what you're trying to say. And that balance, you just use the tools as best you can. And at least you know what you're getting into before you walk into it instead of just doing it and seeing where I rank six months from now. And, oh, man, we missed the mark on that. <laughs> so, yeah, Brandon, is there a question in the back? Yeah. Is there data available by question for the company that they need to know what the stock is targeting based on dating that person from 10 months ago? And that's built in. Would that be stock targeting? Maybe it should be because I bought the data. Stock is still targeting six to seven months later. Is there a data that they would say is average? take this one. So his question for the people watching online was, when does the targeting stop? Like, I went to PetSmart, how long did I see ads? And are they looking at data? Are they looking at analytics? Is there some magic rule that you go by when you start target, stop targeting people? Um, if I can plagiarize what you just said. The answer is the software. So AI, the platform we buy off of, the AI picks the people that are more likely to respond than others. If you've been targeted for your car dealership example, you've been targeted for three or four months and you haven't clicked on anything and you haven't shown up to the dealership, you're gonna roll off their queue and somebody else new who came in the dealership is gonna start seeing ads. They'll start showing ads to people who have a better propensity, which is more fresh data, and let these old people who haven't responded yet, they just kind of roll off the dole. And what happens with you with Dodge, you said Dodge, you're seeing more ads now six months after the fact, that was a former vehicle or whatever it was you had. So Dodge's national campaigns, they may have a geofence set up on your house for the next five years. They know if you're, if you're going to buy one Dodge, you might die, buy another one. And so they're not targeting based on that one purchase. They're, they're targeting based on the fact you bought a Dodge before. And so it just depends on your campaign. I, I will tell you, um, 
as the data, again, it's real time, and it's always coming in. So there's always people coming in and out of your fences. There's always people coming in to most you know, likely to move. They just came into that income category. They just moved into a house. Whatever those things are happening. So that real time data overlays on top of stuff that they know has worked in the past based on conversions. And so it'll show more as the people who are more likely to convert than people who don't. Quick example, um, we had, um, when we're doing geofencing, you know, we, we could put 15 places we want to geofence. Well, if people from this one place are seeing a lot of impressions, but they're not clicking on anything, but this other place, whoa, those people are clicking and they're also converting. Well, guess what? Those people moved to the top of the list. They're going to show more impressions of these people being fenced on this location. And the people who don't respond, not because of them, but because of the location, that's the tactic we're using, they kind of drop to the bottom of the bucket. So what normally happens with our campaigns when we do geofencing, and this is for small businesses, not national campaigns, we'll come up with 10, 15 geofences, and we turn them on and we get them going. And part of the, the art and the science of this is watching the data and making adjustments as you go. So we'll see some of those places that we thought everybody that went over to my competitor would come to me. Well, they're not. So guess what? Let's just take them off. Let's just quit targeting them. And so that ability to do that kind of real time is the other advantage of digital. In print, once my magazine leaves, that train's gone. The next one's not for another month. But with digital, I can change it on the fly. And we can make those kinds of adjustments on the fly as well. You guys have been great. Thank you so much for coming out. We will thank our guys. Thanks, Dave, in the back, and all of our staff who came out and helped. Thank, thank you, Paul Sylvester, for warming us up. The link will be emailed to you, the presentations, everything. Just check your email tomorrow, and also that survey if you guys will respond back. We'd love to know what you'd like to learn more about um, so we can get our future stuff going. Thanks, you guys.